this sweet god and backward compatible, Phil Johnson and Will Parsons visit to discuss the ways time travel is used in video games. Plus, the crew debates the merits of Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. The BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. <laughs> Backward Compatible. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners. This is podcast number 42. Yes, you've heard me right. And today our topic is time travel in video games. And uh, today I'm joined with, uh, well, this is Jim, um, and joined uh, as usual with Doc. We have Doc here. Um, Chris is absent. But uh, we do have um, a fill-in. Phil is here. They, they, they made this joke <laughs> before we started recording, and then they made it again. Yes, and, and we might mention it again. So this is time travel. We're going forward and backward. Um, and we also have Will. Hey, guys. He's Will then. What? No. To be Re- here? Don't. <laughs> Careful. Oh, wow. No. Careful. No? I think, I think the three people who listen to the podcast just dropped he, the he's forced, he's forced to be yeah. here against his will. There we so, go. So, uh, yeah, you've just opened Expect expect some Jim name puns. <laughs> um, yeah, that's going to happen. Because I don't normally touch those until someone touches my name, mm. and then, yeah. My favorite Jim, Jim pun uh, that is brought up is that uh, my name is pronounced the same way that it's spelled. J-I-M. That's a good point. No. Yes. What? I get it. J I M Jam. J I M. Like the southern pronunciation of my name is the same way that it's spelled. J I M. We're from Jam. Texas. We don't know what you're talking about. I'm not really from Texas. You don't get so. it. No. Well, neither am I technically, but <laughs> no, I, 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 feel like, I feel like I, I failed. <laughs> you uh, failed? <laughs> I, I failed a southern check. <laughs> so, time travel, you say? Yep, time travel. Oh, excellent. <laughs> we seem to have hit a stop. We might be in a bit of a gym right now. Yeah, uh, it could be. It could be <laughs> so this is episode forty-two. Welcome yes. to. The uh, podcast. But yeah, so Doc, you said you had a uh, possible icebreaker. Oh, I do. I, I do. We're um, stuck in a time loop. Time travel quotes. Okay. All right. So this is the way that this is going to work. I am going to give you a time travel quote from. Uh, most of these are from fiction. Okay, I will even go out on a limb and say all of them are from fiction. Um, what I want you to do is to give me, if you can, who said it, and then also in what um, popular time travel movie or book or other media piece. Okay, so for example, if I was to say uh, you're just not thinking fourth dimensionally, you would say it's Back to the Future. It was uh, Doc Brown. Very good. Excellent. Okay, so uh, here is the first official one. That one was, was zero. Right. Defense network computers, new, powerful, hooked into everything, trusted to run it all. They say it got smart, a new order of intelligence. Then it saw all people as a threat, not just the ones on the other side, decided our fate in a microsecond. Extermination. Kyle Reese, Terminator. Oh, you got a first <laughs> name, too. Very nice. Uh, which Terminator? No. The only one that Kyle Reese was in. <laughs> If only that were true, right? Yeah, that's actually no, not true. It, the only one Kyle Reese was in. Oh, well, that's true. Like, his, his brother was in others and various things. No, I'm just not acknowledging He's not acknowledging that. Oh, it's sort of like that fourth uh, Indiana Jones movie. Yeah. yeah. They made a fourth one? Yeah. Or like how there's only three I Star Wars movies. This. Yeah, it's great. It's just as good as the second one. Actually, the I don't Temple know of Doom that. was a really good movie. And it, I will, it's Temple, horrible, dude. I strongly no, disagree. No, what no. what makes it so horrible? Temple of Doom gets a bad rap. Yeah, no, it's it, good. Who gives it a bad... What's okay. bad about Temple of Doom? We're talking about Temple of Doom. The MacGuffin? Well, the MacGuffin, it's racist. Well, the MacGuffin it's, appears and disappears that way, immediately. Like, so nobody what? cares about the MacGuffin. So what? It's exactly the same as in 4. Nobody cares about the MacGuffin. Yeah, but the storytelling is much better in 2. No, see, the difference. The thing is... The it's just a classic adventure. No, see, in Temple of Doom... We're going to get sidetracked here. I'm sorry. Well, it's too bad. No, that's too bad. You can edit this out if you want, but... We're talking about this. Uh, in Temple of Doom, the <laughs> MacGuffin is very clearly defined. It is clearly defined. And, hold on. And it's supernatural, which falls in line with the theme of Indiana Jones. Yes, true. Right. And this is before they made the return to the Christian artifacts. Yes. Right. So at that point, it wasn't expected to be a Christian artifact that Indiana is hunting for. And it's also a class. It's also presented as a classic adventure, unlike unlike the fourth one that is like completely not presented that way. Right. It's written as a classic adventure in the era it's a good, that it was written. Yeah, but it's, so it's, it's, it's a better different. follow-up for, for Raiders also. Yeah. 
than than um, Last Crusade, which honestly they they that's the one where they switched up the formula a lot. I mean, I still mm-hmm. think it worked because they had Sean Connery, but but. Going back and watching them, Temple of Doom is actually a stronger movie than Last Crusade. Yeah, but I will, I will say that Short Round and What's Her Bucket, I forget the girl's name. Both annoying. Uh, Marion? No. I think it no. wasn't. No, no. Marianne Marianne was, she was the, the first, first one. She was the first one. Yeah. I know it was like Kate Capshaw, I think, was yeah. the actress. Uh, the, the girl was just insufferable, but that's not the point because we're watching it for Nina Jones, right. not for her. I also, also, Club Obi Wan. Yeah. So he also. Can you reference that, but my point about the MacGuffin. You start out, you go through everything, you get to the point where, like, you need to go find these things. Mm-hmm. They find them immediately. Yeah. And rather than it being a pursuit, like it is in every other movie, where did it go, what's happening to it, and the focus staying on it, mm-hmm. except for the fourth, where you really don't care. That's the thing, um, is well, that you don't, don't care in the fourth. You also don't about care anything. in the second one. Like, I watched this pretty recently, mm-hmm. and they know where the MacGuffin is. Yeah. They find it by accident. Yeah. Um... They get it almost immediately. Mm-hmm. He carries it through the entire movie. Sure. And it sits in his satchel like, kind of probably like the plot for the writers. It just sits there. <laughs> no, it's about wow. the complications. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, I mean, they're telling right. a very different kind of story it's, where they, yeah, they, they, they achieve their goal and then the rest of the movie is fallout from the goal. It's a very different way of telling the story. Yeah, and I, and I'm, not defa- I'm not saying it's a fantastic movie. It's clearly the weakest of the trilogy. But the Which f- I also disagree with. Well, that, that's fair. And you, <laughs> I'm just saying it's equivalent. I, I believe it's the... I believe, no, I actually think that uh, of the trilogy, it's the weakest, but the fourth one... The fourth is one doesn't so, feel like it's part of the trilogy. The fourth one well, is, is my well, That'd be a quadrilogy yeah, yeah. then. But it's, but, it's uh, just... Thinking fourth dimensionally. Yes, now. I am. Uh, but the fourth movie was so insufferably bad. I actually think it's an insult. I mean, if if you can't consider, if you want, it, okay, it was like the Star it Wars prequel. It, it is the same. It is one. so bad that is an insult to Temple of Doom to compare it to, to four because four was so off key. It's it. When they when they introduced aliens, they made it a science fiction story instead of being a supernatural story. They made it. It, it, that, the whole the whole movie represents a midi chlorian statement. See, mm-hmm. I think that's what kills it for people. Outside of that, no. Outside of that, if they had introduced an artifact rather than aliens, and it had the exact same effect with a similar ending of supernatural beings rising up out of a monument, mm-hmm. no one would have. A I, I, I disagree. strongly disagree. I I, 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 yeah. I, I, I have a problem with it right you away. Go and then I'll go. <laughs> Just I, I completely opinion. disagree because the whole thing felt like they were just trying to do this phony retread of like oh like, yeah every movie that year was that yes but that's that's what makes it such a weak film there's nothing real original or, or experimental it like, doesn't try to do anything new with Indiana Jones it just tries to like, it's, it's the whole movie is hey guys remember Indiana Jones here he is oh by the way here's like Shia LaBeouf and he's gonna In do a whole bunch of stuff form. see that's yeah, what it's, I felt it's terrible about, that's what I felt about the second one except the difference was they no but Temple of Doom now like Phil already driver. explained the way they did the story was different yeah like it was a di- it, was, it was totally different it was just it was a new adventure building off of Raiders, but they changed the formula around. Honestly, Last Crusade felt sort of like a retread too, but they made it work because Sean Connery is a much better sidekick than Shia LaBeouf. But That's why it works. He makes a good point. I would, a good point. I would choose Sean Connery over Shia LaBeouf. He also Every does time. not have digitally enhanced extending legs. Yeah. I want that. I also think Shia LaBeouf would choose Sean Connery over Shia LaBeouf. So. <laughs> well, he's not famous anymore, you see. <laughs> Either way, uh, it's a so, personal okay, Shia LaBeouf The fourth, movie, the fourth movie also made a, a, an arbitrary departure. For no really good reason, they, they set it so much further in the future. And yes, uh, Harrison Ford is aged, so he ha- they have to put it with the times. But for no particularly good reason, they made decisions like, Hey, your immortal dad is now dead. And... And then they, they, they keep referencing um, Marcus, who was yeah, dead. And I know yeah. that that was sort of an homage to him, but they overdid it. And so I agree. they spent so much time wishing that they were one of the previous movies that it also suffered. And then, again, for no particularly good reason, to finish my thought before I got sidetracked, they decided, well, Nazis ain't a thing no mo, so let's be against uh, the, the Russians. So yeah. I'm like, Why? Why even try to hand fist that that type of story? Because Harrison Ford was old. Yeah, yeah. At what least does that have to do with the Russians, though. Exactly. At, at, at least at least with Temple of Doom, you you had like you know the, the crazy uh, spiritual leader guy that would rip your heart out of your chest. I mean, come on. Which related to the story because he was in the story. Which is my. It's why I think it's a horrible movie. It's a very nice collection of really quick conflict resolution scenes. None of which really relate to each other. It's just one to the other bumbling through, kind of like watching the high points of MacGyver episodes back to back. I, I just okay. I didn't so get what, that was the, what was the worst scene 
in Temple of Doom. Oh, that's hard. Anything that wasn't the fight in the Obi Wan bar. No, there's a lot of great scenes. Like for like that I, whole. I asked what the worst scene. Yeah, there were a lot of great scenes in that in Temple of Doom. Oh, like the mine, scene. the minecart scene was was excellent. That's and one I, of the, I, one I of the greatest count, like, actor points to it. So thing, whatever his, the worst scene is. This is probably not the worst, but it's the one that I can remember most clearly because okay. it's the one where I most rejected the movie. Okay. His suddenly, I am no longer mind controlled. Okay. No, he was never. No, I, hold on, I, I, I got this. I'm suddenly no longer mind controlled. Okay. Because I thought because, it made sense. Sense. because they burned him. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it made and, perfect and sense. Fire they explained it. It's it part wasn't of the whole thing. It wasn't. Yeah. They, they, okay. they had set that up. So my, my worst scene would probably be the monkey, the, the like monkey brain, the whole eating the. Eating oh, yeah, that's horribly yeah. inappropriate. But I was talking from a from okay. like a plot so, standpoint. Let's let's I'll, let's accept this. It's like a monkey brains and uh, fire chest, uh, Indiana Jones. Do you want to do you want to toss one in, Adam? If you're just joining us, this mm-hmm. is podcast number forty two. We're talking about Indiana Jones. And the, <laughs> that was an accident. We, we have a, we I have a, a, I have a method. Do you do you, do you have a scene? We have officially time traveled back. Honestly, to the, I think yeah, the, the heart. Worst. I think the heart removal scene. Um, really, the worst was was one of the worst simply because it's biologically. Uh, impossible to have one's heart removed and continue screaming. So it threw me. Keep in mind, I was like, I don't know, 12 when mm-hmm. I saw this. I, I didn't understand what was going on. Mm-hmm. And I thought maybe he, he had entered into a magical realm or something. It is magic. Though. It is magic. He was using magic. That whole They were using the stones. Yeah. The whole that thing. whole thing was magic. But that's, okay. that's the problem that I had. Let me, let me, you asked me my opinion. I know. And my, so we have, <laughs> you three, gave the wrong opinion. We have, you, did, you did give the wrong opinion, but we have, <laughs> we have three scenes that you all think are the worst scene in that movie. And the question at hand is, and I'm not going to try to say it's a great movie, but compared to four, is it better or worse? Is, are any of these three scenes worse than CG gophers? No. Also, I, I would say I can't even think of what the best scene is in four. I still wouldn't put it ahead of any of these scenes we or, just mentioned. By or getting into a fridge to survive a nuclear bomb. Yeah. Or uh, getting, and this is interesting. I'm gonna I'm gonna bounce off of your point here. Mm. Is it is the having your heart removed and going umum shabai umum shabai? Is that more or less unrealistic than being basically eaten alive within? Microseconds almost of touching a fire ant uh, mound. Those were fire ants, but they're also not real. So, but they but those were presented not as supernatural. Like at least in yeah, Temple of Doom, that was supposed to be a magical like ceremony that they were doing. Yeah, when it came to melting yeah. Nazis, having your heart removed and surviving for a short, at least a short time afterwards, mm-hmm. or becoming uh, instantly desiccated from drinking from the wrong cup. Those all have plausible in-universe explanations. Mm-hmm. So not the fourth the movie, however, has or, or, or the expl- or the well, nuclear they, bomb if surviving were, the nuclear bomb. Yeah. I mean, that's there's, there's nothing they're, supernatural they're about that. They're science. just saying, yeah, this stuff happens. So, even though it's the one that's supposed to be the most connected to science, because it's got the whole alien connection. Right. No, no. So, it's supposed to be the most connected to 1950s science fiction, and that's the key that you guys. I'm going to go on the on the offensive here for a second and actually defend the movie, <laughs> even though I hate it. Okay. And here <laughs> I don't it like is. it either. Here are the record. <laughs> Here it is. Mm-hmm. The first three movies were about action films of the 1930s. Yeah, mm-hmm. the, the, the pulp films. Yeah. Fast forwarding, because Harrison Ford was 30 years older, you could no longer do a 1930s or 40s movie believably. No, and that action genre was inappropriate for the time that it needed to be set in order for the actor to be that old and him to have a son that was as old as Mutt was. That said, God, that name. I know it needed to be set it's in the 1950s name. and 60s. So because it was set in the 50s and 60s, even though that was still kind of fudging his age a little bit, um, what they went for was 1950s and 60s serial sci-fi, and that's why it was so crappy and cheesy. Is because they were embracing that. But I think that's also what makes it not an Indiana Jones movie because that's not what the series is. And yes. had there been two oh, totally. more like it. And had it been more successful, call it Mutt Jones and the insert thing here. <laughs> I love that that's how you, pre- you preface it. If it was successful and well-liked, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Well, if it was actually good, we wouldn't be having this All conversation. I'm saying is with a few minor tweaks, we might not have complained quite so much. And then there might have been more. And then we might have not had the argument of, oh, it doesn't feel like the other ones. We might have said, you know what? 
episode one, two, and three feel the way they do, and then all the stuff that leads up to Jedi. No, wait, I just shifted universes. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, uh, minor, my, minor point, and I actually think you are correct in this. Mm-hmm. I think that I think that the world has a shorter. Uh, fuse when it comes to George Lucas properties, and I think that we had a much, much lower tolerance for the fourth movie, as terrible as it was, uh, because we were already, we were, we were still angry about, about the, prequels. The, the prequel. Yeah, yeah. that's very true. Prequel, Especially yeah. his insistence on Jar Jar Binks. Like, just the insistence oh, of, yeah, yeah. no, Putting him he's in the third not movie. dead. He's going to be in the third movie. He's in the third movie. Just, he didn't say anything. But him just being there is still just him giving the middle finger to there. It is. The it really is. Like, he, he's just like, you he will get the charger. Yeah. Now, here, here's what I would do if I, if I, by the way, if I was J.J. Abrams, and I, was, I would actually put Jar Jar in this next one mm-hmm. and kill him off instantly. You know, he's joked about that. Uh, no, I wouldn't. Maybe, I, would, maybe, I wouldn't even joke. Well, I would no, actually no. say, "Hey guys, it's a better buy, it's buy my movie. I am going to like dismember <laughs> Jar Jar Binks." Years old? Well, so who okay, cares? There's two there's things. There's, there's two mortal. things. One, oh, no. Uh, one of it. One of the jokes <laughs> is <laughs> that uh, in Gungans actually have very short lifespans, uh-huh. and so he's dead no matter what. Come episode four, uh, but uh, I, I don't have a source for this, so maybe it's a, so it's apocryphal, uh, but. Um, you mean legendary? Yes, we'll go with that. That Abrams has joked about putting uh, Jar Jar Binks' skeleton mm-hmm. dead in the sand dunes of that opening shot with the Star Destroyer just off in the corner so far away and small, the average viewer wouldn't be able to see it. But it would still be in the scene, technically. Uh, I, I'd go for R-rated Star Wars. Wars. That's how much I would have. Yeah, I would just remember Jar Jar. It would be an R-rated movie. They'd have to. Like, the... the, the Academy would look at it and just like, we, we can't. We, we cannot give this a PG yes. rating. We, we should just probably can't. go back to the topic. We should probably game. get back on topic, but I will, I, will leave, I, will, I will leave the Jar Jar topic at this. He stuck his face in a, a, a racing engine. He should have died in the first movie. Yeah. Time travel. Okay, back to time travel. Sorry. So, example number three. Boy, we're making great time here. Sorry. Um, should you just keep my mouth shut? I'm well, sorry. Welcome to the future. Dot, dot, dot. And I'm telling you, it's great here. The air is clean. The water is clean. Even the dirt is clean. Bowling averages are way up. Mini golf scores are way down. And we have more excellent water slides than any other planet we communicate with. I'm telling you, this place is great. But it almost wasn't. Oh, if you could see their faces. I don't know this one. It's not Hitchhiker's Guide, is it? No, it's not. I didn't think so. No. I, this doesn't sound familiar to me. It sounds like a quote about North Korea. <laughs> Actually, wow, as a metaphor, that, that particular film... It, this is from a film. I'll give you that. Mm. So, so Kim Jong-il uh, in Team America? Right, yeah. No, that, that's <laughs> definitely not it. So the, the, the person who said this, his name was Rufus. Does that help? Oh, Bill and Ted. Yes, this is oh, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. It's yeah. actually the opening line. You, you really just kind of gave wow. away with that one clue. Yeah. yeah. I can't believe That's I didn't get that. I've seen it. Yeah. Well, maybe I could have filled in the dot, 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 which is Welcome to the Future, San Dimas, California, 2680. Oh, uh, yeah, that was. So, th- yeah, this was the movie with that Doctor Who is based on, right? Right, yeah, that's that's totally right. Well, they saw it and they went back in time and wrote Doctor Who. Exactly, that was my assumption. All right, here's an easy one. You've met with a terrible fate, haven't you? Ocarina of uh, Majora's Mask, and it's um, yeah. Who said it though? The uh, the butler. No, not the butler. The mask salesman. Yeah, that would have been my guess was the mask salesman, but yes. not sure. Like the happy mask salesman. Yes. Is that his name? The happy mask salesman yeah. is the correct answer. Very nice. Very nice. Um, let's see here. Let's see if you can get this one. Actually, I have three from this one because it's kind of obscure. Because of my knowledge, I was able to convince the queen I was a mighty oracle, but no history book could have Doctor Who, the tenth doctor. No? Really? Yeah, really. Oh, I shouldn't have interrupted you. Could have prepared me for what has happened here. No, No history book could have prepared me for what happened here. Okay. That's the first quote. The second quote is, This weapon represents considerable power. Your actions may either save or destroy life. Wield your sword with full knowledge of the consequences. And the third one, Gone is the magical kingdom of zeal and all the dreams and ambitions of its people. 
I mean, what was the first it sounds time? it sounds really familiar but I can't I can't seem to play because it. of my knowledge I was able to convince the queen I was a mighty oracle but oh. no history book could have prepared me for what happened here it, it's not Magus or yes. in Chrono Trigger is it? yes oh Very good I actually was Kingdom thinking Chrono Trigger mm-hmm. but then I was like no but and the second part about enough. the weapons oh. actually by uh, Melchior yeah. so mm-hmm. I, I feel a lot okay I feel a lot better about yeah. assuming it was Doctor Who because as soon as you said I was able to convince the queen it's like oh it's the doctor <laughs> but uh, then it was, you said the the zeal and I was like oh right crown trigger well done I was thinking that too and then I was like it didn't that's why I say that one for the third one because it, it mm. made it a little easier um, alright here's, here's a little more classic one you see he was going for the holy grail the boys all took a flyer at the holy grail now and then it was several years cruise they always put in a long absence snooping around and the most con- conscientious ways, though none of them had any idea where the Holy Grail really was, and I don't think any of them really expected to find it, or would have known what to do with it if he'd run across it. No idea. I, I, I'm bad at these. I, I mean, this is classic literature. I have one idea, but I'm okay. not 100% Throw it out there. sure. Uh, it's not a wrinkle in time, is it? No. No. It's I've, about a different time traveler in medieval times. Just to establish, I've, I've played... Is it Black Knight? No, I, I have played Chrono Trigger all the way through, probably at least four times, possibly more, and I still didn't get. Well, this that, was so. not, this was not a video game. This is from literature. It's no, not, I re- I'm just saying I I'm not good at these sort of things. Oh, okay. It's not a kinetic in King, King Arthur's Court. In fact, it? it is. Okay. Yep. Yes, Makes and sense. of course, the narrator is Mark oh. Twain himself because he is unnamed. Yep. That is one of the earliest examples of time travel in fiction. Yes, it is. Not the earliest, but one of them. All right, yeah. my I was personal really favorite. Shooting for Martin Lawrence on that one. My personal favorite. Oh God, that movie was so terrible. It was amazing. You shut your mouth. <laughs> and I like Martin, La- Martin Lawrence. Are you ready? He's back. Are, are you yeah, ready? Go for it. Okay. Oh my God, I'm back. I'm home. All the time. It was. We finally did it. Oh, that's the like uh, at the end of Planet of the Apes, right? Yes, because yeah. it followed Charl- with Charlton You Maniacs! Character. You blew it up! Ah, oh, damn you! Damn you way, all I, to hell, etc., etc., etc. I don't even remember his character's name. George Taylor. Okay. Yeah. That's right, I, I Taylor. That's was, right. Taylor. Oh, I would also have accepted Bright Eyes. Bright Eyes. I, I, I just thought I couldn't think of his character. Yeah, yeah t- Taylor. Um, it's, it's on his suit mm-hmm. because he's an astronaut. That's a great movie. I also really like the, the, the first sequel. Get your stinking paws the, uh, off me. Beneath the Planet of the Apes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That was a great one. That was a good one. Where they worship, worship, the they worship the nuclear oh, bomb. Oh, yeah. Good stuff. Those two new ape movies have also, were also really good. Yeah, that's true. Um, all right. I want to see if you can get this one. When I have the map, I will be free, and the world will be different, because I have understanding. Ah, understanding of what, Master? Digital watches, and soon I shall have understanding of video cassette recorders and car telephones. And when I have an understanding of them, I shall have understanding of computers. And when I have an understanding of computers, I shall be the supreme being. I have a guess, but I'm not. I don't remember this movie had time travel or not. Okay, it's not Skeletor from Masters of the Universe. <laughs> no, no. Similar theme and time, though. Hmm. All right, I'll give you a hint. Uh, Terry Gilliam was involved in this project. Oh, is this Time Bandits? Yes! And the character who's speaking is Evil. That is literally his name. Oh, right. Uh, right. And, he's, and he's talking with Robert, his, uh, what is he, his servant or something? I think so. Yeah. <laughs> he, that's a, that is a funny movie. The Tale of Evil and Bob. Yeah, that, that's an insane movie. Um, basically, the time travel theory involved in that one is there are holes, because mm-hmm. um, God made these like weird mistakes or something. As long as you got a map, you're good. Yeah. So they come out of the kid's closet, and he tags along. Um, yeah, I almost chose the one where, where he's like, uh, Mom, Dad, watch out for the... Boom. Uh, and then his, both his parents are dead, and he's like, Mom? Dad? <laughs> <laughs> Which is, like, my second favorite quote. Okay. Um, I've been meaning to watch that movie. It's on my list. It's funny. I think yeah, it's like... You can move it up on your list. Is it not? Yeah. I, it was on Netflix. It was. Really I, don't know. I, took it I like that movie. I'm in the middle of watching Satan's Satellites right now. It's fantastic. Oh. They're making, on Fox, a TV show called Lucifer. Yeah, it's based on the comic. Based on the Neil Gaiman or Gaiman. It it wasn't actually. I've heard someone say Gaiman, and it's always wrong. It's always stuck with me. I'm pretty sure. I'm sure it's Gaiman, but I I, I he pronounces it Gaiman. But but anyway, I um, saw him on Doctor Who. Yeah, confidential. He says I am Neil Gaiman. But he didn't actually write Lucifer. He wrote Sandman, and then Lucifer was kind of a spinoff. And I, I, who wrote? I can't remember his name. I want to say it's Lucifer. Mike. 
like some more. Well, now you're able to see it on Fox. This probably oh, it's good. No, it's 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 really it's really well written. I can't it remember. Seems who really it seems really entertaining. Is and it a supernatural story or? So what's funny is part of there there and because Satan satellites is actually not it has nothing to do with Satan. It's actually a a, a movie that's a recut of the pre movie serial from 1958 called Zombies of the Stratosphere. No, this is so, nothing. Right. This, what was what was really entertaining to me though when I heard they were making this was before I knew it was you know it was based off of you know the, the comic series. Loose, yeah, the comic yeah. series, and Neil Gaiman was sort of attached to it or something. Uh, I my mind immediately went to Thirty Rock when um, uh, Jack Donaghy was trying to tank NBC by putting himself in TV shows, and he was God and solving crimes. <laughs> nice. And I was like, wait, this is the same plot. Except instead of God, it's the devil, and I, I was actually more interested. The in devil solved in crimes. That's what the that's what the gist of the of the show is. Why does be. he care? I thought he liked crimes. I think that's one of the big questions: is why does he care? Oh, uh, but I, I was sitting there thinking, you know, Planet of the Ages. Like, my God, they finally did it! You finally did it! <laughs> well, you see, the devil is in the details. So, oh, uh, that's uh, right. uh, uh, uh. all right, next Wisdom. one. Hey, this is this is from a film that I literally watched probably thirty five or forty times as a child. I crashed into electrical towers, and my star charts were erased. I need the ones in your head to complete my mission. So you need me and my inferior brain to fly that thing. Correction. I need the superior information in your inferior brain to fly this thing. Was that like Flight of the Navigator? Yep. Yes. Very good. I was that was, of I course, said last star what characters? Do you remember their names? Oh, I, I never will uh, remember their names. See, I, see I, when you said movie you had seen 40 times... It was... I immediately want to say Garfield 2 <laughs> Garfield. in the big city. <laughs> no, I've seen that one way more. Um, <laughs> I've seen that movie it, so many times. It was that like weird little like uh-huh. like head thing thingy yeah. that was in the ship, but yeah. I forgot. I don't remember its name. Max. Max. Max was go. the name of the robot alien that was uh-huh. the ship. And he course, names he names it right. Like, doesn't it have some crazy yeah. name and then he changes? Yeah, the name. yeah, yeah. Um, and then uh, the boy's name was David. Yeah, that's right. I saw that one several times as well. It used to come on Disney Channel a lot. all the time. Yeah, and that's why I saw it so many times. We had a cassette tape that we watched while we were overseas, oh, over and over yeah. and over again. It got progressively worse because of the the tape wearing yeah. out. And... Um, Tapes you would think out. that, especially since we were on the coast. But no, not really. But we just took really that good one care worked of really. It. You keep you keep playing it, and so like the corrosive stuff can't stay on it because it keeps getting wiped off by the heads. It's like a fine. We went line. through like six or seven VCRs. It just gets better and better. Yeah. <laughs> All right, last three. It's black and white by the time we finish. <laughs> okay. If the universe came to an end every time there was some uncertainty about what had happened in it, it would never have gotten beyond the first picosecond, and many, of course, don't. It's like a human body, you see. A few cuts and bruises here and there don't hurt it. Not even major surgery if it's done properly. Paradoxes are just the scar tissue. Time and space heal themselves up around them, and people simply remember a version of events which makes as much sense as they require it to make. That one, I believe, is Doctor Who. I definitely, no. have, heard, I definitely have heard this. It's either that or Hitchhikers. You're really close. I, I know I've heard this, but I can't, I can't place it. It was Douglas Adams. It was Douglas Adams? Mm-hmm. Which kind of oh, narrows it down. gently, then. There you go. Let's start gently. Which one? Oh, okay. um, it's the... Pretty sure it's the Long Dark Peak? No, it's uh, Holistic Detective Agency. Yes. Because that's... Yeah. Yeah, because that's the one that has time travel. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yes, it is. Um, um, and it's it's actually Dirk Gently who says that, isn't it? Probably, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Um, okay. Let's see. Last Seven. two. Yeah, next to the last one here. This is either going to be a really easy one or a really hard one, because it's short. Mm. Shh! Listen, someone's coming. I think, I think it might be us. I mean, that could also be Bill and Ted again. It that could. Was it's my not, it's not. But Josh Kirby Time Warrior. No, it's not. <laughs> Which? Uh, what? What? Josh Kirby Time Warrior. We'll talk about it later. Oh, oh yeah. I'll give you a hint. This is a major motion picture slash um, book series. Motion picture. Young adult series. book series. Oh, uh, Harry Potter. Which one? I instantly uh, don't like it. The um, <laughs> half. No. The one with Pikachu in it? No. Yeah, yeah that sure. One. Might as well be. I no, mean, I know on. this one. It's the one where they kill off. Uh, um, Harry? No. Oh, that was my favorite. The Griffin <laughs> thing. Oh, poor Buckbeak. Yeah, Buckbeak. Yeah. Uh, it was Goblet? No. No. 
Dumbledore. Not Azkaban. I know. I know. There's there's a character named Dumbledore. Yeah, yeah, in yeah. Prisoner like of Azkaban. I called it. Never read the books. Yeah, because well, nice. we, we escape on Buffy. I, I half muttered all. Spoiler of them. alert. <laughs> Uh, they they actually use Hermione's time turner. She's the one who says it. Uh, they use her time turner to go back in time, rescue Buckbeak, and also uh, the prisoner himself, who I, whose name I won't give away because he's I, I, seminal. I still don't get why if if what's his name like was it Snape was the evil guy whoever the evil guy is Voldemort Voldemort there we go why doesn't he just like hire actual assassins with like sniper rifles to kill Harry I just don't understand that it doesn't make any sense uh, magic no but it, but. He can't get in there because of the whole magic, but he can send, like, normal people can just, you know, like, normal assassins, whatever he's, like, not inside. Yeah, but they, can, de- they can detect, I mean... No, they, he, they, he they can't have, detect. They have the Marauder's Map. They know where... He gets surprised any, by stuff all the time, though. Yeah, but if if they ever cross that Rubicon where they start introducing muggles into the magical world, I'm not even that big of a Harry Potter nerd. I'm actually not a Harry Potter nerd, but if they, if they cross that Rubicon, then the whole society of... Uh, Muggles and magic users goes down. The other reason that he never, that Voldemort wouldn't do that is because just, he hates Muggles. He, I know, but still hire hire a private army to go in there and just wipe no, them. No, he, he wouldn't because he hates Muggles. Well, he can kill him afterward, but just it's you use them for your own gain. It makes perfect sense to me. He's just like proud. going out of your way to squish ants or kick What's puppies a, or something. What's a Muggle? A Muggle is a non magic user. user. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. As, essentially, it's it's her. It's essentially a bigoted term that she came up with to describe right. all of us. Yeah. See, this whole time I've been thinking that they look basically like Moogles. So, mm-hmm. from Final Fantasy. No, no, that would be much cooler. They're the cat bears that look like a Chow from Sonic Adventure. Yeah. yeah. Right. All that is that he wouldn't do it just because he, he's got Death Eaters, and that's actually in theory more effective. To be fair, though, he was Muggle born. He was. He yeah, was, but it's, he was a mud blood. Which is also, as, by the way, a bigoted Hermione. term yes. that she came up with. Extremely. She's, she's encouraging, like, um, um, anti-interracial Well, I don't think she's sentiment. encouraging. I think that it was one of those things, because, like, uh, uh, like, Harry lived with a muggle family. Hermione's parents were muggles. And of the three of them, Ron, who I think was the least remarkable of any of them. In the yeah, he was the pureblood, actually. And he was the pureblood. Yeah. She wasn't really encouraging it. She was just kind of... Using it as a as a literary device, yeah, in order to to make her negative character seem even darker. Mm-hmm. But characters that were supposed to be good still use the term regularly. Uh, I wouldn't say that. They, no, they they really didn't that often, but they they didn't have a better word to refer to muggles. The fan base uses it a lot. Well, yeah, well, yeah, but, it's because yeah. they they own it now. Yeah, I didn't even know what it meant. So. No, I meant the mudblood thing. Actually, that's when I was. Speaking. Oh, gotcha. But what? Oh, gotcha. Well, here's the last. Right, so last one. Here's the last one. Okay. Um, and this is the borderline one, the reason why I gave the disclaimer at the very beginning about these mostly being fictional. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to, I was just going to open with like, it's Spock from Voyage Home. Just like, you Spock. got it. Yeah. No, yeah. no. Uh, Wait, here, really? here it is. No, no, he didn't. I, I was going to say, I was about to flip this. It's going to be a book from the Philadelphia table. experiment. <laughs> it may Excellent. interest, it may interest for you to know. That most Canadians in 2036 are some of the most efficient, ruthless, and dangerous people I know. God help Quebec. John Candy and Canadian Bacon. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he was a time traveler. <laughs> the Wolverine. That's a really good guess. Yeah, he goes forward in time. Like, he time travels from, like, 10 AD or whatever, mm-hmm. all the way to the end of the world. That's a that's not at a, a relative rate of one second per second. That's oh yeah. What is I've never heard of this. This is a book or a movie. No, the Wolverine. X-Men. From X-Men. Oh oh, he literally Wolverine. I don't, okay. Yeah, traveling at one second. Per I was second like, no, he's okay. That doesn't make any sense. Okay, he's an old, he's an old Canadian war veteran, and he's the most popular comic book character, like ever. I don't know, but I don't know if I'd say that. But he's definitely up there. Yeah, I heard he's dead right now. This is from a comics. nonfiction work. Called He'll be back. A Time Traveler's Tale. Oh, is that written the- by John Tyner? Yes. Yep. Yeah, that's the one where he posted on all those like um, forums in about. Two thousand. Yeah. Is it two thousand? Yeah. Is it about yeah. the dude who like went time travel by going through a cupboard or something? No. No. He actually he has a no. very, a ridiculously well documented time travel device. Yeah. And his his stories do not check out linearly. Nor would we expect them but to. But fourth it's dimensionally, yes. um, it's time travel. If you follow his rules of, like, in a I'm lot not of people, it's aliens, but it's aliens. A lot of people <laughs> excuse him by saying that if you follow his rules of alternate world lines, it explains why his prophecies don't come true. 
But it's that's kind of a cop out. That's also why my prophecies don't come true. Yeah. By the way, just, just to let you know, my prophecies don't come true because I don't make them. Yeah, you should. You should. But I, I'm afraid of being right. Oh, because that's the thing. I hate being right. Mm. Well, let's go ahead and transition to time travel talk um, about games. Time travel discussion time in games travel. and. Um, one of the things that I did want to talk about was the difference between time travel in games as narrative and time travel as a, as a game mechanic. And there's definitely been tons of games that have had time travel as part of their um, storyline and as a narrative device. Mm-hmm. But not as many, I think, that have used it effectively as part of their game mechanic. So right. In fact, it's one of my pet peeves. I used mm-hmm. to tell my students that all the time. That mm-hmm. if they could nail that in their game design document, that it was like an instant A. And I never had to give the A because they all sucked so. <laughs> I think um, I, did, I didn't even try. I remember, but yeah. Um, uh, but yeah. So that was one of the things I did want to bring up uh, specifically because I, I did write it down. The Back to the Future game, and the reason why. Um, Which one? Sorry, there's yeah, there's like, a, the there's one multiple. that's called the, the, the Telltale one. I mean, the Telltale okay. one that sure. is called Back to the Future, the game. Because I, I was starting and, with the NES one. No, well, that one annoyed me because there were so many um, incidents, so many puzzles that you would be able to solve if you just had a time machine. And you did have a time machine, and you still couldn't use the time machine oh, to actually solve right. them. There so it was rules. very, it was very frustrating. There are rules. I have a whole chart. Like I literally have a whole he chart. Does. Of rules. I've seen, I've seen his chart. But they still could have. They still could have used the time machine to go back and, and fix a lot of these problems. The, the rules probably prevent them. Well, maybe I don't know. It sure, it sure didn't feel that way as I was playing through the game. I think Telltale still hadn't quite found their had, hadn't quite reached their right sort of formula for their adventure games. So I did, it was still felt kind of weak to me. Plus, you just kept returning to the 1930s storyline, and it was just not very interesting. In the Telltale one? Yeah, in Back to the Future, the game. See, I don't know. that's funny, because I was just telling Will the other day that it was actually a really compelling story. Yeah, I just, to me, it was like, it just felt very uh, derivative, I guess is the right word. Well, yeah. To quote George Lucas, mm. they're like stanzas, they rhyme. <laughs> no. No. I think I think it would have been a better game had it been a lot shorter. I think that they they tried to stretch it out, and because of that, you had to keep returning to the same place. And you have a time, you have a time machine. You have time that. travel, and instead, you just we just keep going back to the 1930s. I'm like, I'm done with this. I don't want to be in this place anymore. And they just keep going back. And I get why they did it because it saved them on resources. But and, you know, they didn't maybe have the budget. But if that's the case, make a shorter game. Well, they are kind of married to the five episode model, mm-hmm. which is interesting because they sort of devised that five-episode model uh, with Guybrush uh, in, Freeport. in the uh, yep. Monkey Island. Yeah, the Tales of Monkey, Tales Island, of Monkey which, Island, which, by the way, was a really bad Monkey Island game as well. I really did not. As, See, as a Monkey Island fan, I worse, really didn't like it. Is it worse than the fourth one? Yes. Which also includes Time Escape? Travel, I found out. Yes, it did include, include yes. Tribe. In fact, we should mention that because it's interesting. Just one little... Uh, when uh, when Guybrush from the past... Or present. Guybrush present from the Guybrush. present meets Guybrush from... Wait, Guybrush from the past, essentially... No, Guybrush from the present, as you are playing the game, you run into yourself from the future. Yes. He gives you a key and a series of items. And it's it's random, too. And he says different things as he hands them to you, and, and you're in and a random order. Yes, and then you also are, are able to pick your responses. Yes. And then later in the game, you encounter yourself, and so you're basically do, having to go through the same exact... Um, situation, although mm-hmm. you have, but now you have to remember what order you accepted the items and Give what you said to them, the exact same things, and if you don't, then you've created like a time paradox and you lose the game, essentially. That was like basically that's the, hilarious. that's yep. basically the only funny and clever thing of Escape from Monkey Island, which was the fourth one. Otherwise, it was kind of a failure in my opinion. I liked the first three a lot, but yeah, Escape was kind of a failure, and then Tales to me didn't even feel like a Monkey Island game. It just felt like everything was dragged out the adventuring elements just it did, weren't really there for me. I, I, I didn't think the jokes landed either. Hmm. Um, See, I, I and I was excited great. to play it. I was very excited to play it, so I was very disappointed. Maybe I expected too much. Could be. Because I, I really liked um, the first three. Did you play the special editions of one and two? Mm-hmm. I wish they'd make three and four the special edition. Well, I think I think three in particular. I think the art in three was already so excellent. I, I really do like the art style in three. I know some people don't, it was I like good. It, but sure. I thought it was great. And I think that maybe they could have cleaned up the animation a bit. But mm-hmm. other than that, and just I think re-released the, it. Yeah. Otherwise, I think the art is fine. Now I forget. Did three have voice? 
Yes. Is that where um, the voices started? Okay. And I actually thought the voices worked. Yeah, okay. Because what they did was they got the original voice actors, or at least some of them, and re-voiced one and two. Mm -hmm. And so that, oh, nice. with the re-release, that's the best part about it. I yeah. Think. No, it worked. And Well, I also liked how they had that... Um, I don't know if it was a button or a, or a keyboard combo that you that you pressed, but you could see the old pixelated versions. You could like yeah. zoom back and forth and see. Here's the, the way we redrew it. Yeah, whatever, and then yeah. here's here's the other way, and um, that was always pretty cool. That was sort of like time travel. <laughs> so, um, well, while we're on adventure games, <laughs> um, another one I did want to bring up was uh, Space Quest Four. I don't know if any of y'all have played any of the Space Quest series. It was another um, comedy adventure game. This one from Sierra, and I also it was also one of my favorites growing up. Essentially, you're a uh, space janitor, mm -hmm. and you sort of like you're sort of a goof, but you sort of uh, you save the world in some very accidental sort of ways. Um, yeah, that one was right at the same time as what drag? What was it called? Drag? Police Quest. King's, King's Quest. King. But King's Police Quest, Quest and as Police well. Quest. Yeah, I played Police yeah. Quest. So yeah, that but, was not a comedy. No, it was not. No, no, unless you have a very yeah. interesting sense of humor. Well, I think what's the fantasy one? Dragon something. King's Quest. There was King's there was Quest. a quest. Yeah. For, there was there was King's Quest and Quest for Glory. Though. Quest for Glory was the other one. Okay. King's Quest and Quest for Glory. And I think King's Quest honestly was not actually very well designed, but um, I didn't it's realize the only that one as a I kid. played. <laughs> but uh, but Space Quest was actually pretty cool. At least I, I think that it actually had some pretty good humor, um, sort of along the same lines as the Monkey Island series. But uh, in the fourth one. The big joke and the time travel element was handled through traveling uh, back to previous iterations of the game and then also traveling to future iterations of the game. So you had, um, it was the fourth one, and you could travel back to the first Space Quest, and you kind of had to to get a few additional items. I'm thinking of Space Ace. Oh, that's, that's totally why. different. Yeah, no, no, this, no, this, was, an actual, different. this yeah. was an actual game, not, not a laser disc cop-out. Ouch. Um, it's DDR. No. It's DDR, man, with the joystick. No. No, I, I'm not giving that to you. Um, yeah, so you could travel back to the first one and the, st the third game, and you could also travel into the future to uh, Space Quest Ten, and then also Space Quest Twelve. So it was like pretty neat. You had this, I think, uh, twelve. One of those was Vohal's Revenge, and the other one was the the latex babes from Lesbos, I think it was, or something like that, or Phobos. Phobos. That's right, because the movie is actually that's an Infocom game. game. I don't think my mom would have let me uh, play that one. It was it it was basically a big joke. Essentially, oh, okay. yeah, they were making. They were that making makes it all good. Um, oh, but well, yeah, if it was I, for humor's sake, I thought that was a pretty a pretty clever way to do the whole time travel. But of course, that was just a narrative. Thing. If you're talking about adventure games, Beyond Zork had time travel elements to it. Yeah, that's, that's true. true, and it's technically an adventure game. Yeah, so that's a good point. Uh, the whole the whole Zork series was had very sort of like either time travel or interdimensional. It always kind of mm -hmm. had that. Um, sometimes it wasn't very clear if it was time travel or dimi or different dimensions, but it it, it was a, it was interesting how they handled that. Yep, it was a very surreal series. Um, but yeah, so getting on to some of the ones, I don't know what you guys, uh, how many you've played of some of these, but um, I did want to talk a bit about some of these that used a time travel as a mechanic. Um, I know when I was I was mentioning my list earlier that Will, you seemed interested in Day of the Tentacle, and you've yes. played that before. It is a fantastic game. It has one of the better time travel mechanics mm -hmm. as as a mechanic in the game. Yeah, you want to talk about it? Uh, sure. Um, actually, you've played Day of the Tentacle, right? Yes. Have you? Would you say the the mechanic is similar to the time travel level in the cave? Yes. So, have you played the cave? Yeah, that's actually yeah. a pretty good comparison. So it's essentially so. like that, except on a larger scale. Um, and funnier. <laughs> yeah, much funnier. You end up with three characters who get scattered across three eras in American history, and you end up grabbing stuff, because all you can do is send items through time. So you end up grabbing stuff in the present and in the future or the past and sending them forward to each other, trying to adjust things in later eras so that they have a permanent effect on the future. And as you do things, it takes a permanent effect on the game. Which, mm -hmm. yeah, it's linear because you have to do the same thing every time. But for direct mechanic stuff, it's one of the better instances of it, I think. And it handles it in a pretty clever way, like the yeah. way that it's set up. I mean, that, that could very easily be... That could very easily not work. Yeah. So if you just came up with that concept, it's very easy to, to screw that up. But they did it right. Yeah, I really like the way it was done in the cave, actually. Mm-hmm. Or you know you, you trigger things and then ten thousand years later or whatever you see the effects of it, uh, just dripping water becomes a stalagmite. It's you know that's that kind of thing. Yeah, there was a little bit of that 
in Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword mm-hmm. because you have a you end up with a device that allows you to look at things in the past. Yeah, it's that it's the I, it's yeah. the time shift stone with yeah. the Laneru Desert, I believe it was, and you essentially there's that you can go back in time to when like the robots and all little like defenses and stuff were were still active, and you kind yep. of had to in order to explore um, different parts of the desert. I think maybe to get into a temple. I forget hmm. exactly. Um, but yeah, it, yeah. That, and that that is arguably a mechanic uh, mechanic thing. I mean, it really wasn't like a huge focus of the game, it but, wasn't it was, the point, but it was there. And that same mechanic is as funny as it is. That's the mechanic in Sonic CD. Oh, really? Because for each act, you have past, present, and then two versions of the future. When you first go into a level, you go to the future, and it's a horrible future. And you can beat the level in the future and get a better future because you showed up after everything had been horrible and fixed everything. Or you could go back in the past, wipe out the holographic projector for the for the enemies that were there, wipe out the robot making machine, go to the present, then go into the future. It's now a good future. And when you finish out there, or at any point after going into the past and stopping things before they happen, you get a good ending. If you do that in both levels, and then you go into the boss level, I'm trying to remember, I may be wrong. You either end up with a good future or a bad future based on what you did in the two previous acts. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I've never played Sonic CD. Yeah. You end up getting... There are three different types of endings, maybe four, I believe. Uh, One for getting all the time stones, one for not, and then variations based on whether or not you got all the good future endings. So... For a speed platformer, which typically doesn't use time travel, the only other platformer I can think of that uses time travel is Blink's. And Braid. There's another one we were going to mention. Is it a platformer? Because mm. I haven't yeah. actually had Braid's a chance a pla- to play Braid, Braid is yeah. a platformer, and I kind of argue it's not really time travel, it's just the rewind button. I mean, which... It, well, they it do, uses time as a mechanic. They it's, not, it's not just the rewind button, though. They do. He does other things where... Um, you can essentially, in one of the levels, in one of the stages, each stage sort of has like a different take on time travel. Mm-hmm. And on one of the stages, you have that little shadow of yourself where you do one of the little moves and then it sort of like does a replay of you and you can use that to sort of like pick up objects and bring yeah. them to yourself and, and, and things and, like and that. And in other, in other levels, it's like the clouds will always progress a little bit further forward. And right. Forward. Or like, or like um, if you move, if you walk forward, it does forward in time and backward, it goes yeah. backward in time and things like that. That's the weirdest thing. Is like, I... I, I as as braid as a mechanic goes, it doesn't feel like true time travel. It just feels like it, it almost feels like uh, uh, almost. It actually seems more reminiscent to me as like uh, uh, Prince of Persia, Sands, Sands of Time, which is another one we were going to mention. Which is more like, oh wait, yeah. that's not really how that happened. But there are parts of the world that don't listen to you, and you're saying that. It's, oh, I thought you were going to uh, compare it to the the actual re- time reversal. Mechanic. Well, it's, 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 it's basically person. what it is. But well, he has two versions of. It. He has a version where you actually die because you can't back up far enough to stop your death. Yeah. And then he says, "Oh, that didn't happen. Never mind." He's like, "Yeah, right. I, I, I don't know. Maybe I yeah. drink it too much. That's not the right <laughs> yeah. way the story went." And then I died. <laughs> Wait. Wait, no, I, that that, <laughs> that doesn't sound right. But well, the back step is technically it's a pretty strong hallmark of science fiction. You think of TV shows like Seven Days, which I don't. Did mm-hmm. anybody? Okay, you've seen it. Yes. I've not seen Seven Days. Um, basic premise, they developed element 115 on the periodic table, which... Mm-hmm. No, 151. That makes more sense. Yeah, I was going to say, like the only, yeah, like the the only magical one I remember was 116, yeah. and that's because that dude from who said he worked at uh, Area 51 said that that's the one we need for anti-gravity. And then we made oh, it, wow. and then we don't have anti-gravity yet. Yeah. Yeah. Or do we? Bum, bum, bum. <laughs> I don't know, I think it's canceled out by all the gravity. Yeah. Um, well, but basically, they have a device that allows them to go back in time, but only by seven days. That's it. You know, I would take it. And, and uh-huh. I really would. And they use it. It's a disaster film where something horrible happens. Oh, and I have. one guy can go I've back I've heard in of time. this, mm-hmm. and I, I, I haven't seen it, but I have. Oh, wait a minute. I have seen part of this movie. I think I saw. It's a TV show. Is it a TV show? It's a TV yeah. show. Isn't there it's a movie right like this? Well, basically, he has to get to a phone booth really fast after going back and yeah. calls in, and he says the passcode, and they're like, oh no, something's bad. It's going to happen. Huh. And he has the full support of the government. To fix the thing, because they know that seven days from now he's going to come back and do it. Okay, I could have sworn there was a movie that's sort of like this, where he can only go back a certain number of hours, and he keeps going back, and they, they only use him because he's dead, or, or like partially dead, and his, his yes, brain is hooked up to uh, machines. Yeah, that's the train. And, he's yeah, on the train. Yeah, what is that movie called? It was pretty good. It was, it was very good. Um, the Code? The Code, yeah. Uh, because... There, the the 
the meta behind it is that they this not our universe. Right. It's a different universe. Right. And so they've tapped into the code of this other universe. Yeah. And, and he's it's actually just an echo. Yeah, and he's actually like his his spirit or whatever is like going into another right. body. And he's going, uh, no, I'm gonna change this. And I'm like, you can't change this. It's already happened, it's just an echo of the past. Mm-hmm. It's not a real thing. And he's like, No, no, no. This is just, this is a different universe. And so yeah. he, he's convinced that he can affect that universe. And then at the end he he uh finds out that he's wrong and it was all a delusion and he thinks that he's going to go off into the other universe but really he just dies. Yeah, because that's what happens. See, that, that was, that was my dark, dark interpretation so of the ending. So no, it's like um, La Jete, then, only with a darker ending. <laughs> no, I, I, I made up that ending. Um, no, no, that's you, a, you mean Journeyman, which was the reboot. They did a reboot? I know the Journeyman Project Turbo was a time travel. No, that, that's a different thing. Cool. Yeah. Uh, no, if, Journeyman was a one season and, and in my opinion mm. absolutely brilliant modern take um, and except that he was jumping into his own life. Well, Quantum that was in Quantum Leap. It was all those things were within the span of his own, of his own life. Yeah. Within the span of his own lifetime, but he was literally jumping into his own body. And um, his wife was on board with it. It was tough, and they had to figure stuff out. But um, she knew it, and that was the coolest thing to me. Was that uh, she's like, "Where were you this time?" And you've been gone for. You've been gone for three weeks, and let's talk about it, and, and that kind mm-hmm. of a thing. But he had he had for, figured out these um, called tricks that he would start taking his old cell phone with him. Like he, he dug in the drawer and he, he he charged up his cell phone from 1992, and he'd keep it with him so that if, as long as he jumped back to that you know point or later, he could use his phone. And there were these really cool moments where people would like call him on that phone, and he have to decide whether or not to, to answer it. Hmm. It was neat. Was that a TV show? Yeah, it was a TV show. It was called Journeyman. Hmm. When did that come out? Oh, man. It must have been about 2006? Five? Hmm. Six? Oh, I might have to look that up. Now. Yeah, it's, it's worth well, looking up. You say, yeah, the reboot from 10 years ago. 10 years ago. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, if uh, speaking <laughs> of, of Quantum Leap, I, I did want to mention if, if y'all have good memories of Quantum Leap, um, I know or I, any memories of yeah, Quantum Leap? Yeah, I, I remember enjoying it when it when it was on TV, but um, I went back and saw some of the Netflix episodes mm-hmm. and <laughs> found out that... What? I just remembered some of the episodes uh, I watched on well, Netflix. I was going to say, I, I still liked it. I mean, I still liked the show, but I just... Uh, by the time they get to the third season, it they changed the intro to make it, I guess, more action-y, because they were trying to like mm-hmm. save themselves from cancellation or something. Yeah. And just... Does it make any sense at all? Does it mesh at all with the show? Like, the, like, because the presentation is a much more dramatic base mm-hmm. and a lot more low key, and they try to make it seem like it's some sort of weird action show. Sam, where have I leaped into today? I'm a woman. Yeah, that happens a few times. I like it. I like it where he leaps into a a cop that is undercover as a hooker, a male cop undercover mm-hmm. as a hooker, and he thinks that he's leaped into a woman because he can't tell the difference because it's just his, his body. It looks like yeah. him, unless exactly. it's nice. And so he thinks, oh no, I'm a woman again, and then he's then he realizes, nope, he's a guy who's dressed as a woman, who's trying to do some sort of a sting for. There are some some episodes where he leaps oh into when he situations leaps into he, a monkey. Well, yeah, I was the gen- say, there was one yeah, where he I think leaped that was into the pilot, into a, actually. No, it was not. No, no. It, was, it was definitely first season. It, when he le- when he leaps back into handicapped people yeah. of, of various handicaps. That was Down Syndrome. I, I yeah. Was, yeah, I was trying to find Jimmy. The, His name was Jimmy. Jimmy. I was trying to find the most yeah. delicate way to put that. It's like that they one. they did that. Oh god, but then you, you leap back but into But then in the third retarded. season, he no. jumps back to no, but they actually did. A, I thought they did a good job with it. I mean, some of the I, I some of the really words they the used episode, maybe fair, it, right. it was good. But then they then they go back. He jumps back into his into into Jimmy again in the third season, and they have this weird demon subplot where like, there's a, like a demon leaper that's trying to that's trying to ruin his yeah all the of female his, leaper. It was really. I thought it was pretty bad. Yeah. That whole element. <laughs> um, female leper. But yeah, going female leper. Going back to the jumping back to um, back in time only a certain period. There's a game that does this that I thought. Uh, is worth mentioning called Ghost Trick uh, Phantom Detective. I want to make sure I get the name right. Have any of y'all played it? Don't it's on the uh, DS, I believe. And essentially, what? The, the way it works is dead. that you're dead. Okay. I, think so, I think it's on, by the way, iOS devices as well, so you could probably get it on your phone or something. Mm. But um, it, you're essentially, so you die, and now you're trying to solve murders and prevent murders. And the way that you do that is that you can go back in time by four hours, and then you have to sort of trigger... Um, trigger things in the environment in order to prevent the murder. So you have to kind of like see almost kind of through trial and error, like if I if I trigger this, then now these sort of events take place. And you kind of have to keep 
within that like four hour limit, try to figure out how you can, uh, first of all, you have to figure out what happened, then you have to figure out how you can prevent it from happening. So it's kind of a neat uh, time travel element. Um, but Prince of Persia, I know we, we mentioned when we were talking about Prince of Persia before, the whole series is basically time travel, isn't it? I yeah. mean, is the whole idea well, is that he... Sands of Time, Two Thrones, and Warrior Within. The original right. wasn't. It's just a platform. Right? No, I meant the Sands of Time series. Yeah. Well, the modern yeah. version, mm-hmm. kind of. Yeah. No, Sa- yeah, Sands of Time is sort of its own yeah. series. And mm-hmm. supposedly... Um, they went back and did like a 1.5 that was supposed to happen. Forgotten between, Sands. Forgotten Sands. Which was actually really good. Yeah, but that really had nothing to do with uh, time yeah. travel necessarily. It just, um, as a mechanic, I suppose it did. Yeah. Well, it still had the, I know the I know the first three still had that. He's trying to prevent himself from doing things. Like in the first one, he's right. trying to prevent himself from, from breaking the hourglass and getting the sand in the first place, right? Right. It, and that's part of why he's telling the story. And, and the rewind mechanic is pretty much in all of them, which is why yeah. it's considered a time travel mechanic, but... Mm-hmm. Did anyone else play Final Fantasy thirteen two? Oh God, I couldn't stand Final Fantasy thirteen. It's like an on rails game. Uh, thirteen two was better, and it had time travel, but it didn't really feel like time travel because almost none of the worlds were connected. Hmm. Granted, you could go to uh, you go to the same area like you know in thirteen thousand BC, and you go to the other one, which is like six thousand eighty in the but way they're working it, but it wasn't. But there's nothing like Chrono Trigger where you leave something in the past and go pick it up in the future. There Which was I thought was pretty two cool. Things there like was that. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, there was a couple instances like that, but I, I wouldn't really call it. It didn't mm. feel like time travel was the result of it. It's like, hey, because you did MacGuffin A, result B is now available. And uh, I mean, I, I, it's the only game I think I have a platinum trophy in. Oh, wow. <laughs> it yes. be fun. Don't judge me. Chrono Trigger, some of the things that they did, and, and really a lot of the whole future was sort of like, was kind of dark anyway, but I thought, for uh, for example, the way that you had to leave, you left like Robo in the past, and you pick him up like thousands of years later. He's cool with it. Yeah, I always, because he was aware that whole time, I, that always kind of like freaked me out, the thinking fact, about that. Uh, he's chill. He's the like, it was his idea. idea. You can actually fight the final boss in multiple time periods. Right, yeah. And depending on how you play the game, you got different access to him, or yeah. if you talk to a bucket. Because you also yeah. have the you also have the, the new game plus option where you can defeat him the one. first time around. Yeah, and it sort of prevents a lot of the game from happening. You kind of beat the game early. Yep, which is kind of cool. Just having the new game plus is almost like a time loop. I, mean, I don't mm-hmm. think it's really meant to be, but it almost feels that way because the whole game is well, especially time if you, travel if you go defeat defeat Lavos by. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you can do that. Yeah, you can get the developer room. Mm-hmm. Um, Which makes even less sense. Talking about leaving things in the past, I mentioned this to you to you earlier. There's a l- lesser known Nintendo DS game called Time Hollow. Mm-hmm. It's based on the touch screen for the DS. That's like the whole premise. But you have a, a pen that allows you to open portals in time. You just draw them. And the whole point of the game is picking up objects from the past or placing them into the past or the future, either one. Uh, the rules being that you can't go through yourself because otherwise it's a paradox and you lose the ability to use the pen, etc. Hmm. Um, it's brilliant. It's awesome until you realize it's linear because it seems like a really cool mechanic. There's one point in the game that I know of where you can actually place something or not place something and you have the choice of doing it rather than you have to do this just to advance the game. You know, the next Elder Scrolls game should have time travel. As opposed to the time travel in some of the others? Well, I mean, like, as a major mechanic. Oh. What, they go into the future and it's the... It's like the urban. It's Fallout. I was going to say, it's basically I, just I've Fallout. I've heard that theory, actually. I think, that, I think that doesn't work because the Fallout series actually has really great lore and depth to it, whereas Elder Scrolls just comes across as bland fantasy to me, but... Maybe that's just me. It is. It, just, it I've never been it. a fan of Elder Scrolls. I, I have always felt that it's so just bland and uninteresting. Well, you didn't stop to read the well, books, did you? One of the one of the theories out there. It should be in the game, in the game world. It shouldn't have to read books that, inside one of a the game. Theories out game there world. is uh, <laughs> uh, Fallout, and now that they're owned by the same company, mm-hmm. and this obviously wasn't the way it was bef- beforehand. But now that Bethesda owns both of them, people are trying to find ways of connecting them. Uh, one of the theories is that Fallout actually comes before Elder Scrolls. Uh, in that... In fa- what? Yeah, in Fallout... People will come uh, up with any kind of theory they want. That's ridiculous. It's either 3 or New Vegas. Uh, 
you actually launch you, you get the opportunity to launch a cult of uh, ghouls mm-hmm. yeah. into space. Yeah, that's New that's Vegas. In New Vegas. And, yeah, yeah, New Vegas. And you can eat, you can choose to direct them to the sun or off into space. And mm-hmm. one of the theories out there is that. Uh, as you leave Earth and all that, you know they get away from radiation and they have, they subsist on the radiation of space and all, that, and eventually they come upon Nern. Uh, and because the the, the Daedric Lords are there, they're all like, "Hey, what's this?" They grab it down, and that's where uh, men came from in terms of uh, uh, Tamriel. Because you know a lot of people forget this when it comes to the Elder Scrolls lore. Uh, on in Nern, or at least in Tamriel specifically, um, elves are the native people. All of them. The the uh, the men of Mur. All that's of true, them. Yeah. And so the Dunmer. Uh, I just kind of assumed that uh, was the case because that's normally the yeah. And what? Sorry, dwarves. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, all, all of all of the elves. Oh, they're from there. Right. And men, as in like the Bretons, Imperials, uh, and Red Guards, they came from far north. Well, that's further north than the map actually extends from. And so some people have interpreted it at, uh, and there's some other details to it, because like, I'm trying to do this from memory, but uh, one, of the, one of the thoughts is that uh, refugees and or those ghouls landed on Nern and uh, basically headed south over time. And... You know, generate. You know, they are sterile, if I remember right. But there's there are ways around that when you have Daedric lords in the mix and magic and magic, uh, and so there, the theory is that uh, humans, if not those specific ones and other ones, came to from Earth, from Earth or whatever in that same universe, and it's actually set further in the future than Fallout. I mean, it's it's a fun theory, but it's like it's a stupid theory. Stretch. It's a stupid theory, yeah, but I think it's fun. It's fun to like think about the link up there, yeah. but. That just doesn't really uh, make I swear I'm not Plus, pulling this on my butt. This is yeah. actually something, oh, something I, I people didn't you. think. Anyway. Plus, the I mean, the tone of the two series are, are so different that I don't really think it... Are they, though? Yeah. I don't think so. We'll just ask Fergus and and, and, and him tell us. Who's mm-hmm. Fergus? Eckhart. Basically, the guy who, Fallout who created oh. yeah. the Fallout universe. Well, he, but say, he would say no because he, would say he no. doesn't work for Bethesda. I right, assume. exactly. Right. Yeah. Well, well, he I mean, did. If we're going to be connecting like Bethesda-owned properties, where does Castle Wolfenstein fit into this? You know, I... I, I'm not. I, I just. Dude, I actually just Fallout. finished uh, the New Order last yeah, it's, night. I, I loved the New Order. That was great. That's interesting. I really enjoyed it uh, because when I, I finally I, I played it and then I set it down for a while and I just went back last night and played like the last two three levels. Mm-hmm. Uh, ultimately, I don't. I mean, I recognize and appreciate that it was a good game, but I didn't like it. Really? Why? Yeah. I felt it was arbitrarily dark. I didn't know who they were trying to appeal to. I just, for me, I mean, the story, I, it did definitely get pretty dark. And we actually talked about it on uh, well, some early pad podcast. Mm-hmm. It was, I think, our first roundtable game, if I remember mm-hmm. right. I think you yeah, yeah, I remember, I remember y'all talked a bit about it. But um, I, I agree that there's definitely, the story gets pretty dark. And sometimes it's almost, it feels like it's almost a little too forced. But at the same time, what really drew me to the game was I thought the mechanics were very strong. I thought the yeah. the FP, it felt like an older style FPS as opposed to a lot of the modern Call of Duty style, which I really am not a fan. Yeah, of. And, and, and and that's why I, I really like. I don't it the disagree most. with any of the, any of those statements. Uh, I, I, could, I don't want to overretread anything you guys already yeah. talked about, but uh, since since we're talking about it. For my part, having having just finished it last night, I actually didn't sleep all that well last mm-hmm. night because of the video that led into the final fights. Well, that's good then, isn't and it? I mean, no. Listen. Why is that why is that good? Because it had it because it had such an impact on No, it. that's bullshit. I'm sorry, but because why not? because isn't that what you want from from any from any sort of media? Like, oh yeah, yeah, of, yeah like, I love impact? I love losing sleep. The impact does not mean disturbed. And that's I think that's what they're confusing here. This is I mean, it very much struck me as the new order exists in a post Game of Thrones world where they're they're trying to appeal to I guess that audience, but what? That's interesting. Just, just, I, don't, I don't actually like Game shock of Thrones, value so. is not impact. Shock value is something that that can sit with you. It, it can you can cause you to brood on it. it. Can do a lot of things, but 
it's, it doesn't cause me to sit there and think, it's like, wow, that's a really interesting story. No, what they did was they took uh, Death's Head mm-hmm. and made him into a boogeyman over the course of the whole series. First thing you do, is, the first thing you see is him gouging out someone's eyes. And then the second thing you do is you see, I don't even want to repeat what I saw in that, in that uh, video, but... And that just turned him into this weird boogeyman. He wasn't even a character. He was this weird elemental force of, I take people apart. That, they were and, trying to make him like um, Joseph Minkola, but like cranked up. So it was the idea. My, my, what my point is, though, is if they wanted like to Nazi make that... and all that. If they wanted to make that impactful, or, or if they wanted to make it uh, interesting, not just impact. Because you can, you can hit someone in the face hard enough, and they're going to feel it no matter what you do. Uh... Make him into a character where you see these things and you're like, wow, that is crazy. Or, you know, you, you actually understand him as a character and see why he's doing these things. And, and you kind of get that. You know, the, the nearest analog I have for that, what I saw in that, is uh, uh, Oberyn, uh, you know, the, the in Game of Thrones, so near the end of the previous season. Sorry, spoilers. Uh, where, you know, his death is actually feels very similar uh, mm-hmm. in the way that works. And. You know, tonally it's different, but the, the mechanics are the same. And I'm wondering, who are they appealing to with this? So, like, at, at what design discussion, and I know this isn't time travel, what design design discussion around that scene were they saying, like, you know, people are going to love this. This is going to be the best thing. I and, think and this is going to really add to our game. I, I really do think that it was, it was, like I said, they were trying to basically... This was supposed to be an alternate history in which the Nazis won. Yeah. So the idea was, we're going to take actual historical figures and mm-hmm. Death's Head was, was clearly based on Joseph Mengele. Sure. And so they were going to take these these historical figures and just kind of crank them up into a more um, a darker more disturbed gorier more mm-hmm. evil for lack of a better word. Yeah because he wasn't evil enough. Yeah. But that's not really that involves alternative fiction but that's just my no, no, that's my that, they did that. Is, they did that as a as, as, a, as a choice. Yeah. They did. I'm not saying yeah. they did that because of the alternate history. Yeah. I said they did that as a choice. I understand the choice that was made. What I don't understand is why because, they because made the choice. series because the series was going in a grindhouse direction is why. Mm-hmm. And so that was it was supposed to be like an old grindhouse type um, film inspiration. I think that's the I answer. So that it's, yeah. it's meant it's yeah. meant to be. It's like that's part of the game. It's meant to be this. Over the top, vi- like over the top violence, over the top gore. It's, mm-hmm. it's supposed to be that experience. And so, if you if you don't watch grindhouse films and you're not you're not um, familiar with that, it might come across as a bit of a shock. I haven't played uh, the new one that just came out. The um, old was it called Old, the old, old Blood. Order or Old Blood? The old old Blood. Blood. Yeah, um, I, I want to play it, but my computer can't run it. I don't have any of the new consoles. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, I hear I, that one is is even more like the old uh, Return to Castle Wolfenstein. See, that's what I wanted, I think. And that's, well, that one's that one I'm I'm looking forward to because see, for me, I still I, I still accepted the story and I still I still liked some of those elements because I, I got what they were doing with 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 the grindhouse atmosphere. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, it was really the mechanics that made me love the game. And I could have completely they could have completely stripped the story away from me. Uh, for me, and I would have still really enjoyed it. I know Richard would disagree yeah. because he liked, he thought the story was great. But um, I, I could, I could Richard take it. Or leave wrong, it. But I could take it. Or, I could take it or leave it. I, 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 I was, so yeah, exactly. I was, I was perfectly fine with uh, the mechanics. But and was, I, yeah, I agree that the mechanics were good, and I enjoyed the va- the the vaguely split storylines. And uh, you know, I thought the play was fine. Well, you get a totally think, different character in your in your yeah, base. but mechanically it's the same thing, right? It's not a real. Di- well, it's not well, a real they decision. Do, they do get the different mechanics of the. Um, you can either you ha- either have the ability to pick locks or the ability to I forgot what the other one is, but there's like a yeah, difference. So it's just a minor difference. It's but... and then that and then totally different characters inside your base. Well, yeah, depending but, on which one you get. Uh, so it's worth playing if you want the di- if you want a, the different characterizations and you want to feel like hey I was gl- I'm glad right. I made this decision, but uh, I I don't know I I I. I I get, I get what you're saying with the whole grindhouse thing, and I understand that it's a genre. Uh, I, I guess it just didn't sit well with me, and you know, it's, it's gonna, it, if that's the kind of game that we're getting into, I feel like I don't. Uh, it's gonna be, I'm gonna cross this line where it's gonna be a game that I just don't want to play because of that. Have you, even if it's fun? Have you seen Inglorious Bastards? Not yet. Um, do you like Tarantino? No, because uh, <laughs> I actually well, really don't. Well, there you'll see. Because I really do think there's a uh, handful of Tarantino movies. Like I'm pretty sure Inglorious like. Bastards was one of their inspirations. I want to see him well. make a kids movie. I want to know what a Tarantino kids movie would be. like. I think he could do it. But, I'm sure he um, could. But no, I think First Jurassic Park. Same. What? Wow. 
Tarantino kids movie. It'd be basically the first Jurassic Park movie. Yeah. I don't know that I agree, but it's because it's, 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 Jurassic Park is Spielberg. It's, I mean, great. it's, it's yeah. yeah, it's quintessentially Spielberg yeah, in almost every capacity. I don't know how I don't see four those. rooms. I liked I liked four rooms. That's I, not technically a Tarantino film, but he's in it. Hmm. I kind of enjoy the first producer. Kill Bill. My I don't. I the second either. one I don't I enjoy. Like one. I thought I thought Kill Bill would have been um, ex- an excellent movie if they had stripped away all the filler and made it one movie as opposed to yeah. two. Now what's really interesting is because they are somewhat similar in some ways and they do kind of go in the same channels. Mm-hmm. Uh, Robert Rodriguez. He can do he can do the mature super adult movies, and he can turn around and do Spy Kids. Mm. Well, but Spy Kids is pretty terrible. But um, even his I, I his know adult, people who would disagree with you, his, but I, and, and, I, and they're all and they're, and, they're and 11, right? This is all past their bedtime, so they they wouldn't even be here to, yeah, to see them. No, a lot of people are like a lot of people are in college now with that were the Spy Kids generation. So that's, they just that's didn't horrible. grow up. Yeah, yeah they didn't so grow not, up. They not having actually been. I don't think I was the generation anyway. Spy Kids, the first one, is a horrible movie. Mm-hmm. And coming from a guy who likes The Phantom, not The Phantom of the Opera, The Phantom, which is smash, also a horrible smash movie. Smash Evil? Yeah. Yeah. I just kind the of... The Phantom was I, a cartoon before it was a movie. Oh, it, was a it was a comic strip. It was a comic strip. Yeah. Before it was a cartoon. Long before it was a cartoon. It was a radio drama as well. Yeah. 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 Before it was a comic strip. But, you know, interesting. <laughs> before, sorry. Before, before, we, before we leave off of that, uh, Machete yeah. was in Spy Kids, if I remember right. Like technically, no, technically, Spy Kids was a prequel to Machete. Right, no, since, I think since we was, seemed that to, was more of a cameo. Moved away from since we seem to have transitioned into uh, let's call it uh, speculative futures or uh, alternate uh, <laughs> histories as a part of our time travel, um, I, I will just go ahead and throw out Walking Dead and say one of the absolutely most brilliant villains ever of all time ever was the Governor. Hmm. Um, now, which version of the governor? Are we and talking I'm about? talking about the comic book version, Kirkman's original comic book version of the governor. I, I felt the changes in the TV show were actually really good, though. I thought they were good for the TV show, and I think this is a really important point that we need to make whenever we're talking about um, stuff that exists in more than one version. Mm-hmm. And that's when we're talking about transmedia, which is kind of my background is that you have to make the adaptations the right way. Mm-hmm. So, as an example, um, there is a a uh, rather notorious, shall we say, rape scene hmm. in the comic book, which oh, yeah. just defines his character. It's a defining moment for his character. And whenever they got to that part in the series, some have said they copped out on it. I don't think so. I think that what they did was they split the character, first of all, and made it much more interesting that he was um, having a dualistic relationship with two women, and, and one was dark and one was supposedly loving. And then, uh, you know, she discovered him later, and it made it even darker. Because mm-hmm. then he was he was messing with, let's just call it the dark side of love. I don't mean to imply that rape has anything to do with love, because it doesn't. But, mm. uh, you know, the idea being that, uh, you know, that something that's supposed to be good has been turned dark. Uh, he did that with both of those things. Not just, you know, the sexual aspect, but also with the emotional aspect. Yeah. And that was brilliant. It was brilliantly done. And then when we got to what we thought was going to be a rape scene, it wasn't. And then I think it was like two episodes later, we got to one that almost was. And it was so well done that we didn't need it. It didn't have to become a rape scene because all of the intent and the darkness and the hatred was there within that. And um, it was with someone who had a relationship with someone yeah. else, and all. I mean, it was. I remember the fallout from brilliant. that from that scene, by the way, and and people still complaining and saying yes. that it was like. And then no one mentioned that Glenn was like brutally tortured, right? And just ignored it. It's like, well, I mean, he threatened he threatened to rape. What was her, what character's name? I, I can't believe uh, like you know Maggie. Was, Maggie. Yeah, yeah they're Maggie. like he threatened to threatened to rape Maggie. It was so terrible. And yeah, I mean, it, it, I'm sure it was psychologically scarring all this. But Glenn was beaten to a pulp in the next room in yeah, the same episode, and you're not even mentioning it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, come on now. I mean, that's. Let's try to have a little comparison here. I mean, this is ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Oh, let me throw this out there just because I don't know if we can keep going on this, but to tie it back to time travel, David Morrissey, the guy who played the governor in the TV show, mm-hmm. right. was almost the doctor for Doctor Who. Really? Uh, yeah, he was actually in... Uh, for which which he, one? Uh, would he, have been? he probably would have been 10, or it might have been... He might have been, No, he was going to be 11, uh, but uh, he never 
he was never officially gonna be eleven, but they the, there's an, a, a Christmas special called the Next Doctor, mm-hmm. and after they you know passed on him, they brought him in as a person who overtly was not the Doctor. Small spoiler, but mm-hmm. he thought he was the Doctor for an episode, so he wasn't Doctor Who, which is about time travel. I remember that one, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Now, since you went ahead and kicked open the blue door, um, why don't we why don't we talk about that? Uh-oh. Um, are we gonna spit on the floor when we say the name Stephen Moffat? We can just not talk about him. Or let's not talk about. I think it would be more interesting if you're going to talk about Doctor Who. I think it would be more interesting to address the concept that the Doctors all use different rules for time travel based on the generation of Doctor. Fantastic. Let's go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, should I bring out my chart? By all means. Okay. Yeah. So I spent a while putting together a list of different rules for time travel. Uh, there are twelve of them that I have. Uh, most of them, they're variations on relative and things like that. My personal favorite, the Eighth Doctor, has what I call, or what he calls, the web of time. Wherein everything is interconnected. If you go mess something up, time tends to fix itself because there are other interconnection points. There are mm-hmm. key nodes, and if you mess them up, you have to take their place. Or time will put someone in their place for you. Um... So the Eighth Doctor's is heavily on Web of Time-based travel. Uh, Whereas you end up with... uh, I I lost his... I totally lost his name. I only have one law of time travel. Time in San Dimas is always moving forward. Which is (laughs) relative time travel. (laughs) Which I think is most of what Matt Smith uses. Like, if you watch his stuff... He can only return to a point, or typically only return to a point, based on the same amount of time that he's been gone. It's not always that case, but a lot of the time, that's where a lot of his, that's where a lot of the driving force is. I don't have enough time to get back. I don't have enough time to do this. And relative time travel is a major aspect of most of that storytelling. Hmm. Uh, anytime you have a time travel mechanic, where they're like, oh, we only have like an hour to do this, even though it's in the past and we have plenty of time to get back there. Um, it's relative time travel. Uh, no, I actually don't think the Eleventh Doctor follows any actual rules because oh no, but it, it, it's all about what's convenient for the plot. Because uh, in the Christmas special, A Christmas Carol, uh, he totally just place, does yeah. whatever he wants and shows a level of control over his time travel that is uncharacteristic for him. All of them do change the rules they have. I'm talking the average of it, mm. and I think the average of the Eleventh's tends to be relative, where he's stuck going the same amount of time. Not every single episode, because there's stuff where he just does whatever he wants. Yeah, a, um, a lot of that. He uh, has plot time travel. I mean, maybe I haven't thought about it, as, I definitely haven't thought about it as in-depth as, as you, but I know whenever I watch uh, Doctor Who, I just sort of get the impression that science is not really a huge concern. It's sort of a... It, it comes across to me as, like, supernatural and magic and not really I mean it's like super science so it's essentially magic because we don't understand it but it kind of depends on the author Uh, Nicholas Briggs does a fantastic job of keeping time travel relative to whatever story he's writing and um, really pays attention to the ins and outs of it Hmm. Uh, but I don't think he's written any TV episodes so not as as well yeah Hmm. because he's so he writes like are they novels? Radio dramas. Radio dramas. He's the ma- right now he's the major writer for the big Finnish Doctor Who radio dramas, hmm. um, which are fantastic. How They're, long have those been running? Since ninety nine, ninety eight, something like yeah, that. Yeah, a good while. Which uh, which Doctor is he using? Uh, he uses he's been using fifth through the eighth, hmm. um, and recently started using they recently started using the fourth Doctor as well. They hmm. also have a couple of episodes with uh, the first three Doctors. Hmm. And they, I, I guess he sort of he finds other voice actors that are nope. no, they get the actual to. doctors when they're able to really, yeah. yeah. And all of the all the episodes with the fourth through eighth or the the fifth, well, the fourth through eighth are all done by the original actors, as well as their companions. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, and, and in a lot of ways, I mean, the show does borrow from the big Finnish stories and canonizes some things as well. So yeah. it's actually worth watching because... Or worth listening, listening to, to. <laughs> Yeah, It's worth listening to because some of it is canon. Hmm. And really, it's kind of... Uh, because of the Eighth Doctor's adventures, um, it, uh, most I think all of those are technically canonized now. I believe so, yeah. 
Um, mostly, mostly because of that one like five minute episode. Yeah, because he like list. listed off like thirty names or something. Yeah, <laughs> it's like wow, all these people are real. Ergo, now their stories are real. But no, he maintains like every time he's writing for the Eighth Doctor, he maintains the Web of Time story. The one exception is in a storyline where they start it with the rules have already been broken which means that we can use this rule set to fix everything. And then they follow through on that, and it's kind of a, what I call, slice of bread time travel, mm. where all of time is a single loaf of bread, and you can pick whichever slice you want to make your sandwich. Hmm. Yeah, I don't... I want a sandwich. My, to bring this back yeah. to games, my, my impression is I don't think any game has really put that sort of an effort into time travel. It's difficult, because, I mean, when you're putting on a television production, you can do whatever your budget allows for because you only have the one decision. Right. Because for better or worse, a story about time travel is going to be presented linearly. The story itself might not be linear. You might go memento on it and you start with the ending and end with the beginning. But um, the way it's going to be consumed pretty much is going to be linear. Yeah. Right. In effect, Back to the Future is a great example. Yeah. yeah. The, um, the games or the, yeah. or the film. There are, I mean, there are... There are the possibilities for. Uh, I watched uh, them out of order. Alternative reality games. Did you know? Yeah, where you could I watched do. Them out of order. That's funny. But he, but he means, uh, sorry, Phil. He means what he's saying is like the, each individual yeah. film is still unless you yeah. are like fast forwarding well, through was, parts of the film. I was. He, he was talking on the other and like you yeah. have to watch the films. You end up watching the films sequentially. So that I watched out of order. Which changes up the overall story. Yeah, but piece by piece, but, it's, but each yeah. individual movie. What do you? Well, that's each, what Phil's getting at. Like you're not is going to be linearly. Yeah, consumed. You're not fast forwarding oh, yeah. to. I'm going to watch the 50 stuff first and then watch. Yeah, the hit random stuff. Um, tracks on your DVD. Yeah, and see what happens. Yeah, yeah, it's not going to be a pleasant experience. But if you I was going to say that there are yeah. alternative reality games that you could do it that way, where well, as true. you navigate through it, you can piece together the story nonlinearly. So it is constructed not to, to be nonlinear. But I think video games are really absurdly difficult to do that with because. You have to, as a designer, you have to make sure that the experience is proctored enough that it's coherent, which is really difficult if the story makes no sense at mm -hmm. any given moment. Because it's like, hey, here are these new enemies that you don't know about, and you have not learned how to defeat. Uh, I think game design, or, or Fatui, or you know, player training, I think in many ways, if you want to go really into the rabbit hole of what time travel can mean uh, is at odds with the way we teach people to play games. You remember Akron, yeah. the RTS? I am familiar it's with it. builds itself as being the only time travel RTS. The idea behind it is that you can um, do stuff in different time periods and so by developing and clicking you know, build mm -hmm. back here in, in time A, over here in time B, it's built. Right. And so you need to think fourth dimensionally in that sense because you got to fight your battles not just back then but also in the future. Mm -hmm. um, I would love to see more of that kind of a thing. Uh, I think that, that that is going in the right direction. But uh, to build on what you said, Phil, um, I think using a time travel mechanic in a video game is very, very difficult. Uh, there, there's multiple problems. The first problem is that whenever you go freeform like that, you break story. And so um, whenever you have nonlinear story, you have to make sure it's cohesive. Well, suddenly there are tricks for that, like um, there's the branching model, but there's also the bottlenecking model, but there's also you know these other ways of doing it, parallel story, things like that. So some, some have approached it by going with replay value as the solution. It's short, but it has lots of replay value. Mm -hmm. And others, um, you're basically locked in. And so it becomes not about a mechanic at all, but about a way of telling the story in a non-sequential way. Yeah, I think that's that's kind of what I'm getting at. Is I think as you go further towards being ergodic, that allows you a lot of freedom to bounce around and do yeah. what you want with that. But you're still going through the limitations of the system. Uh, you know, what does that mean? Like, what part of the game have you jumped into and things like that? I think what it would be an interesting challenge for a game design would be to find a way to take the take the uh, storytelling mechanic of uh, Memento, not Memento itself, but you know the way that it jumps around. You have to piece together the you know basically you begin at the ending and you end at the beginning and, and everywhere in between is interspersed semi randomly. Mm -hmm. uh, if you could do a game where you start by defeating the final boss. Mm -hmm. And you don't, and it still feels like the final boss. It feels like that's what you're doing, 
uh, you know, without wasting all that time, for example, on maybe learning or like teaching the mechanics of the game, mm-hmm. if you find a way around that that bend where you say, okay, you already know how to do all these things, make it feel like so you feel make like it, you're at the end of the game. Make it feel like you personally don't necessarily like you don't know what you're doing, but it feels like your character does. That's a cop out, I would say. But Assassin's Creed did that. Yeah, it did it very well at the very, very beginning. Maybe yeah, um, a little bit. You but... had all these awesome skills, and then you were stripped of them because of your sins, and yeah, you had to build them. It's back the, up. Metro- the and, Metroid. Effect. But I think it'd be yes. really compelling to have the beginning of the game feel like the end of the game. But you don't feel like you're lesser for it by not having by basically being level one instead of level ninety nine at the end of the game. I think that would be a really compelling challenge, and I think it's incredibly difficult. And that's probably why we haven't seen something like that yet. Yeah, I think the closest since you since you mentioned Assassin's Creed, and I I uh, brought up Metroid, kind of reminded me of Metroid, is I do kind of have that. Um, it's sort of been a running theme in in uh, the Metroid games after the. Um, after the first one, where you start out with all of your abilities, and then uh, you you fight some sort of a boss, and then you lose all of your abilities, and so it kind of gives you a glimpse of what your future, like level ninety nine version of Samus will be. But of course, it's not really a time travel related yeah. story. It's just you you're just stripped of your abilities. Well, it isn't necessarily like a time travel. And the controls are the controls are the same. It's just that you have more options. So you know, it's you still know how to play the game. It's still simple. Yeah, simple I would design. argue that if, even if time travel itself wasn't a reality of the of said game, if this existed, it would. I mean, you're still traveling through time for the purposes of the narrative. And I think one of the one of the things that you know, and not to discount those two examples, but seeing how awesome you can be, mm-hmm. I think is different than what I'm getting at. Yeah, and no, and I and I agree. I, I'm just saying, I think that's the closest that. Um, games have come yeah. to, to your suggestion. But I, I agree, it's a totally different thing. Prototype did it too, actually. You start out with all oh, yeah. the e- evolutionary upgrades and then yeah. it's See, flash. Those usually just frustrate yeah. me as a game mechanic, to be honest, because I'm sitting there and it's like, wow, this game is gonna be fun. Well, I think I think Metroid, uh, to me, is like the one that's pulled it off the best, because I still think that even with all your, your abilities stripped away, it's still a really fun game, and it's still... Mm-hmm. Because you're essentially doing the same thing, it's just that you're not quite as powerful. Well, you're talking about flow theory here. Yeah, what you guys are really talking about. Yeah, that, 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 how do you how do you maintain flow while and, yeah. m- modulating the way the game is presented? Yeah, so that, and that's the balance between yeah. frustration and now, ability. It is kind of funny talking about that sort of thing because it really is frustrating when you play like the first game in a series and then you 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 end the first game and you're a badass and you play the second game in the series and suddenly you're level one again. Yeah, a couple games. Uh, Mothra has just joined us <laughs> in the studio. <laughs> 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 that's a moth. It's, it's a poisonous moth. Uh, Maybe. Was, I, aren't some of them, aren't some moths poisonous? Oh, yeah. To cats. If you eat them. Well, don't eat it. Yeah, don't don't put it in your mouth. Also, don't like me. Stop it. Where was I? Oh, I was going to say. As Mothra you, as you, as is you, a girl, by the way, Phil. Just to let you know. Yeah, otherwise he'd be Mothro. Yeah. Mothra. Duh. Yeah. Uh, I, don't, has, I don't know that Mothra's named after a Latin declension. No, but Mothra, Mothra, uh, like lays eggs and then the eggs hatch. Oh, yeah. and the guy who, All uh, that to say, in in a sequel game, examples. when you start at level one, that's pretty frustrating. Yeah. But Disgaea did that oh, once, uh, where in Disgaea two, you could get uh, Laharl, the main character of the first game, as a bonus character, and after you beat him, and some something along the line happens where he's like, "My levels are all gone. What the hell did you do to me?" <laughs> and he's level one again, or uh, some lower level appropriate so they kinda, for your party. They kind of make a joke. They, out of they, that. But yeah, but they also make it the, the levels and stats and all that are diegetic in the in that universe. I was going to ask on your question earlier. Um, the the joke is past. I can't really make oh, it anymore. Okay. I was going to make a joke about the guy who made that that movie or whatever. Oh, Mel, Mel, Mel Brooks. Yes. Mel Brooks. Yeah. Okay, that's it. Yeah, if the moth was named Mel Brooks, it might be a moth ball. I don't. Spaceballs was the joke, but mm. the moment had passed. So, yeah, we were yeah. out of um, space for that joke. But the question <laughs> I wanted to ask you, you were talking about the, the presentation still being linear. Mm-hmm. At what point is it non-linear enough, even though as technically limited fourth dimensional, we can only progress forward Linearly, at what point is a game no longer linear enough? Because, like Memento, to me, is very linear. You go back to this point, you go forward. You go back to this point, you go forward. But it's always the same amount back. It's never this far back, go to here, then go back to the middle from someone else's view. Um, 
the anime Bakano actually does that. It jumps around to different people and starts the story over and over again right, from yeah. different viewpoints. But That's it's true. still always linear from the start point. So at what point would you say it's close enough to being non-linear, even though we're linear and can't go any further? We can't go... We can't actually think fourth dimensionally since we keep using that, that phrase. Well, and I... <laughs> And I think also with when we're talking about games, if you have a, a game that is presented in an open way, like an open an open game, or as open as we can get it, like say I've been playing through uh, Pillars of Eternity, and the way you can you approach uh, quests in that game, you can do things in a whole bunch of di- like a, a different order. So even though my experience of the game is is linear, and someone else's experience of the game is linear, um, the way that we perceive that that narrative is going to be completely different. Mm-hmm. So these these events are going to take place in a completely different order. Well, I, mean, I may not have understood the question, but I'm going to respond to the best of my understanding. <laughs> I, I didn't really understand your point. It, is my, my well, what I what I demand of a game that ha, that should exist sometime in the future, or either should exist already, and I just don't know about it, is I would love to see a game where you don't necessarily begin at the very end of the game. It doesn't necessarily have to be that way, but that's, a, that's the example I'm using. So you have, the very first thing you do as a player is defeat the final boss and either work backwards from there or jump around through that game, uh, the, that, that, that otherwise linear story, and you go forward like chapter three after the final, let's say it's five chapters, do chapter five, three, one, two, and then four. Let's say you go in that order uh, to make a game where the the the, the, the Ludo experience mm-hmm. maintains flow, so you don't feel like you're you're getting ripped off because you had all these abilities in the first chapter. But at the same you time, you your characters are growing and changing in accordance to where they are within that chapter structure. I think that's the clearest way that I could state it. Okay. But, so not out, but not outside the structure. They're only growing within that chapter. They're not aware that they're jumping around. Like in Memento. Right, yeah. He's it, not aware. It's, it's not, it doesn't have we to, see him jumping around. It doesn't around. have to be a story about time travel because right, right, for right. The, it could be narrative time travel. You know, the player is story is jumping. In a, you know, in a disjointed yeah. manner. Yeah. Okay, that's that's where my question was because I was curious. Because you point? said non like non linear, non linear. I was like, we can only go so far into non linear because we can't perceive things otherwise. Well, I, I think that it's I, I think it's impractical to yeah. even attempt to because I think philosophy majors are arguing about this somewhere right now. What does what does causal reality mean if we're not moving forward in time? What is it? What does an inverse causal relationship look like? It's, it's philosophy and majors and potheads are having the same is, argument at the same and time. I don't, and I'm not, I am not prepared to make that argument there you go. or to try to rationalize Possibly that. with each other. Because if you look at... Because I, uh, I came in today not even know we're talking about time travel. So yeah. <laughs> I'm not prepared for that part. If you look at the, the Feynman, and I just lost his name. Um, I can't remember his name. And Feynman and uh, the other guy who's other guy. just as important... Um, Attraction theory. Hmm. They they address that. Freeman, right? Feynman and Feynman Freeman. and Merriweather. I'm just saying Freeman because that's from Half Life. It's but. it's not. Hmm. Um, but, <laughs> it's like no, Phil, you're wrong. Stop making jokes. <laughs> but they address that from the idea of um, cause being able to be in either direction. So you can have cause before effect, because the effect is also the cause. So oh, cause, ante- co- anticipatory yeah. effect causes the cause when you look at it from the viewpoint of the effect, but the cause is what leads to the effect. Hellman Feynman, I think so. Hellman Feynman, I think he just Google it. I did. Mm. Okay, yeah, but there's that. So <laughs> physics explains it. Mayonnaise causes everything. Yes, yes. that's what I learned from that. Is like yeah. Hellman's theory, unified theory <laughs> of causal nexuses. I prefer the uh, the the Hunt's application. Nah. <sighs> A Heinz application? <laughs> yes, yes, I'm a Heinz man. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm not prepared to make that argument. All that to say, I'm uh, not a physicist either. I, I I also know some philosophy majors, and I don't think that an acceptable answer will ever be reached among 
I'm, I'm, I'm with, and no consensus will be will be reached. I'll, I'll, I think. I I'll mean, once it, it once it becomes a consensus, it's no longer, or at least there's like a solid understanding of it and a solid theory. Then it's no it's sort philosophy, of moves from philosophy to science. Yeah, yeah. So, so. gameplay wise, the original Mega Man or any of the original Mega Man games. Sure. Mm-hmm. If instead of starting with pick this character, uh huh, you fought Doctor Wily. Sure. With only your starting ability. Mm-hmm. We're able to defeat him, and then he retreats to his tower. And then you address the others. Then Which you, you can do in any order. At the end, end um, you end up back where you started, but this time you're more powerful, um, leading to an ultimate defeat. It's easier, because you've obviously gathered these powers, but you can totally do it without it. Uh... <sighs> No, because, because there's, uh, that 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 rem- that there's a mechanic at play there, and you could do it that way. But I think what I'm what I'm more looking at is a uh, quantitative, more than a quantitative change. I'm looking for qualitative changes to the story because uh, if you were to take uh, let's let's call it uh, uh, what's a good game with a good story? Um, Echo. Did you say I, which one? Echo. Echo, Echo the Dolphin? Yeah, oh, that's true. <laughs> well, that's a, that has time travel. Yeah, Enslaved it's Odyssey uh, to the West. Let, what? Enslaved Odyssey to the West. Sure, let's take it's that It's my game. favorite linear on a rail let, Let's story say game. that, uh, or, or something that involves the destruction of the world as part of the final boss. Uh, that that requires you to move into significantly different parts of the narrative rather than progressing through the actions in a different order. Uh, Mega Man is oh, at its core is just a list of oh, yeah, of missions that you can achieve in any specific order. It's like what, like Final Fantasy, essentially. Yeah, if, you, if it was like Final Fantasy and it, and it ended with you defeating Chaos, yeah, but you began. That's what you we began. We that, you began that too. way. Yeah, it, it sort of does. I mean, it has that, except you're not really. It's not the final boss in, in final form. You mm-hmm. fight Garland, who becomes Chaos. He's sort right. of like resurrected as Chaos when the Four Fiends um, come from the from the past and like take him back in two thousand years into the past. But yeah. uh, then, when he returns later as Chaos, he sends he mm-hmm. sends the Four Fiends to go rescue himself. So you have this like sort of time paradox. Yeah, and a, cu- a couple games try to do this, and like we talked about how you start out as an as an awesome badass version of yourself and you lose it, but then yeah, and they do. But that you also naturally. there are a couple games. Some of the Castlevania that, games. Some games open with like the final battle of some other hero that's not you that's not your main character Tales of Fantasia does that yeah and so it's like eh, it's cool I guess they're trying mm-hmm. to experiment with you know like someone else's end is your character's beginning you know, but Lost Odyssey it's a um, Xbox 360 RPG yeah um, I don't know if you've played it it's, it's actually really good I never had a 360 oh, I had a 360 but I was familiar with it yeah. well it's it's a good game and essentially you start out um you start out powerful because it's it's sort of um, before you lose some of your memories, if I remember right. Mm-hmm. And then a lot of the game is you traveling around the world and then triggering uh, re- remembrances of your past. Yeah. And then you get like a little short story. So it's almost like you're being you're being presented with different. Although it's not gameplay related, mm-hmm. you're being presented with different chunks of your lifetime mm-hmm. it, inside. Uh, like being surrounded by the normal present timeline, so it's kind of like almost like a like a different presentation, almost like a memento style mm-hmm. presentation. So the way that the way that I, I mean, having thought about it a little bit, the way I might attempt to present it, I think I feel like a a, a menu based RPG might be a really good easy way to do it. I mean, sure, there's other ways to do it. Like, if you're playing Sonic the Hedgehog, I mean, mechanics don't necessarily have to change. Knuckles Chaotix. Yeah. The, the mechanics don't necessarily have to change as you progress through that, but if we, if we were to use a Final Fantasy-style game as an example, when you start out, you have the 9,999 HP, and that is your easy mode, because you have such a big give. You have a, a huge amount of buffer during this final, quote-unquote, fight. And as you progress through it, uh, the difficulty would change because of the types of enemies you're facing in a given moment. So, like, you know, it's like here you're encountering a specific stat effect, but you're also, instead of level 99, you're now level 70. And then maybe you have to deal with poison for this scene. So you, it whittles your health down at a different rate. And by the time you get to the very beginning of the game, your most challenging fight would be at level 5 or level 1 or something like that. And... It's actually really difficult because you are fighting 
strong enemies. Let's call it that way. And I think some of the the uh, ignoring the narrative because the narrative would you can look at Memento and say, okay, we're telling a story kind of like that. Uh, but mechanically, how you would maintain flow is by having this diminishing uh, strength become how you're handling uh, difficulty and and. Uh, how agile you have to be with the controls that you have. So if it was more like an action RPG, mm. that may be a good way of putting it. You're, I mean, it sounds like you're describing you're basically de leveling. Yeah, is that, is that I mean, doing, do, through through possibly. getting through getting injured. You basically if it, if can it never was like heal inverse, yourself, inversely then. linear, it would yeah. be de leveling. But if it was, uh, 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 you know, uh, randomized and mixed up more, it would be about making each quote unquote chapter of the game. So the, more difficult see, via different means. Via different. Okay. I mean, I guess it's it almost you like they're always little, little it, vignettes in your life. Yeah, because like, if you went from level 99 to level 70 to level, you know, level, or sorry, level 99 to 50 to 80. And then each time you're fighting enemies, they you, you fit within to, this. Fit within that chapter. Yeah. See, That's wonder, the way I would consider doing it. I wonder how that is different from an action game where you start out, your character doesn't really gain anything from an action game. You don't become better. Some of them do, mm -hmm. not all of them. But each level has a different problem you have to deal with as you're playing. Mm -hmm. um, usually they're all separate, discrete. Then you get to the final one, you have to go through all of them at the same time. Well, typically, uh, action games, once you have an ability, you have it forever. Or once they introduce a mechanic, it's I'm going to always the, be built upon. I'm talking about the, some of the older ones, where you just start with all the ones you have, and the progression of difficulty is not in what you've gained and how your your character is changing. It's strictly in how are you treating the level now? And because also, the level is different. And also, you're time. you're learning something. You're learning yes. about abilities you didn't know you had. Uh, did you ever play Donkey Kong the the Game Boy version? Donkey in Kong. 94? No, Donkey Kong. Ninety four um, is usually what's called the Hung ninety four, but it was just called yeah. Donkey Kong. On I played a little bit. Of it. And the fun thing about that is that. Um, it's it looks it presents itself like the original Donkey Kong when you first play it, and you so you assume that you have the same functionality as the original Donkey Kong, but you don't. You have all these other little agile type moves that Mario can do, like he can stand on his head and he can catch barrels with his feet and you know things like that, and then you know walk on his hands and things like that, um, and do like super jumps. And but you don't know that at, at the start. And as the levels get progressively more complex. You have to learn how to do all these different things because in order in order to beat the level. But do you have access to them from the beginning? Yes, and you they do. just don't tell you about it. Yes, you do. Okay. So if you if you're replaying the game, you you can breeze through the first um, the first Donkey Kong levels because you understand that you have all this 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 cool stuff that you can do. And you always have that. So it's it's actually kind of what you were talking about. But that was my question. There was just basically what is the difference between D leveling in an RPG style? Um, however, you mix it on how much you how many levels do you lose? Um, and not advancing, but the level becomes harder. Hmm. Well, this, this is a hypothetical game that I haven't actually right. designed. No, that's, that, that's why I'm curious. I just, I, I'm not like, trying to, to stop on you here. Yeah, I'm there, actually there, is no, there is no game to be discussed, but I would say that like, if we're doing it asynchronously, the challenges that you're presenting would be different per level. So very much like a Donkey Kong level. like, hey, now, I mean, as, as we return to the player, or return to our main character, he has been poisoned in a previous chapter, and so one chapter may end with you being poisoned, so that when you jump to chapter four from chapter two or chapter, you know, chapter three, and you come back to it. So the effects of the previous level persist. Well, it's a, it, it would be a linear narrative if you were to recut it. That That's kind of are what you, my thesis is Are you here. talking like uh, choose your own adventure with variables? No, it wouldn't be in a choose your own adventure because you're, you're going, it would be a narrative mechanic at this point. Yeah, you're not choosing, like, right? It, you're, you're, yeah, it's the like, hey, you're deciding that this is during the, the, the ending cinematic be. of this chapter, you are bitten by a rattlesnake. Mm -hmm. And then you're poisoned for the next chapter. Or, you know, if you were to recut it linearly. I see. And, and finding some way to make that something to be aware of during that gameplay. Because it, it, I, I don't think it's possible to say, hey, I've been poisoned in chapter four, and then somehow I avoid being uh, poisoned in chapter three. Because that, that, that violates causality. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to attempt to to deal with that at the moment. Well, hmm. Okay. Well, I think we've discussed a lot of 
a lot of like interesting things. We've kind of gone all over the place, which yeah, is pretty fantastic. cool. Fantastic. But um, I think it's about time we should probably write a uh, wrap up because I know I'm about to pass out. Yeah. I'm pretty tired. Yeah, so. I, th- I think I think and we've gone this was a good talk. A few we, hours, but yeah, we did a good a good job of defending. Um, uh, the Temple of Doom. Yeah, we yeah. did. Yeah. And, um, Which is really what this whole thing yes. is about. And I know, really I know Chris is, Chris is out nice of scene. town, but I'm sure Chris brought his laptop and has access to the internet so he can cut this up himself. And yes. I'm just kidding. If, if only all of us could go to Germany. <laughs> and, after, after we're done editing this, it's going to be about 30 minutes long. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah, what, what, what conference is he at again? I don't remember. Yeah, I don't remember the name I'm of it. I'm not sure. But is it, he really at a conference? Yes, he really is. I'm just not. I, all I know is he's been learning German on Duolingo, and so I assume he's just like at a bar. Right or has now. he? Or has he already gone? I mean, this is, what a waste of time! He could have been. Is he already back? Now. Technically, he is already back. Because this is happened like weeks in the like, true. in the future. When you're right. by the time you listen to this, he'll probably already be back, and he'll be shaking his head because like, we probably won't believe. be able to figure out how to edit this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you're gonna make him edit it. Ja, und da lo aus der Zukunft. As always, we like to remind you that you can listen to the Backward Compatible Podcast anytime, anywhere, in any way you like. Subscribe and listen to us on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. Then, join the discussion. That was the Digra conference, by the way. I guess we'll go, we'll go ahead and sign off. I'm joined with Doc. By Doc. Joined with, with Doc. Doc. <laughs> yes. We really here. need to get separated. Yes, yes. We need to have that circle. Um, no, wait, yeah, are y'all going to get divorced? But I do want to uh, I do want to thank both uh, Phil and Will for being here. And Yes. You did I, did I point the wrong people? Yes, you did. Yeah. All right. He doesn't know who we are. I'm just, I'm, I'm just doing this. Who it wasn't guys? actually like a point. He's just doing the finger guns. I'm just doing the we'll finger just, guns. We'll switch positions right after this. That way we'll have been right eventually. There we go. Yes. It is. Yes. There's some universe in which he was right. You're not thinking fourth dimensionally. I didn't get to use any, like, future, present, past tense pronouns, so I need to throw in some now. Oh, yeah, because... It was something I would have been looking forward to had we addressed it before we started. And that, there we go. that yeah. will have going to have been really important by the yes. time it would have going to have... It's true. He would have been doing it this um, entire time had he remembered to do this thing. Yes. The yeah. subject never reached a point where it was feasible for me to have had it done properly. <laughs> okay, but, well, but had point. you had thought of it, <laughs> would you had continued to think about it, and then would you have had had these situations to talk about at the end of the podcast? I think these guys are going to go on all night. So. Yes, on that point, I think I think we're just going to... Well, okay, better, sorry, on. right before we just... <laughs> I have a better plan. Let's just build robot us's to go back in time and make sure that you would have had thought of this. And so the good robot us's can make sure that the best possible future happens. Party on, dude. Yes. Yeah. Is it still recording? Yes. (gasps) We want you to join the discussion on our website, backward-compatible.com. You bring unique perspective, and dialogue makes everyone better. Leave a comment in our podcast section, and if it's good, one of the crew members will respond to it. This time, tell us about your favorite uses of time travel in games, or in any other medium. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible.